Right, this is going to be another episode of Summoning Insight. We had to skip one, just because, ne never you mind, none of your business. It's not a fucking regular show. It's not like we've got a slot every Monday on, like, primetime television. I have to explain to you, like, you're the people paying for the adverts, why it wasn't on. There wasn't one, that's all you need to know. Look, we'll skip half the fucking worlds every year if we want cocksuckers. Although, I, I will say, this year, bear in mind there isn't an awful lot with the CSGO, but we probably will actually do all of worlds this year. We'll probably actually <laughs> fucking put our finger on. I know the last few years have been a bit lazy. <laughs> it depends on uh, whether or not there's a major, and also whether or not Riot Ultra condenses the schedule, like they did last worlds because of COVID again. So who knows? Although we'll say in America, not really any restrictions right now. So they should be able to do worlds on a normal schedule. You'd have to believe. No, no, haven't you seen in, in fucking Valorant? They're putting it in Iceland again, probably with no crowd. Like, I don't know why anyone gave Are they Riot doing a... that again? Apparently, in, in apparently that's what's going to happen, yeah. So, it's just fucking nonsense now, isn't it? Anyway, yeah. obviously, we're doing the section. If people don't remember the way we do the format now, we have a guest come on later on. Spoiler, it's a pretty famous player. It's Nuke Doc, probably the best player to never win uh, an LEC title. He'd be in that conversation, definitely. Obviously, an all-time Hall of Fame level player. Although I will say, sadly, in esports, that's even a little prediction there, mate. That's where we will absolutely ruin our own sports. Everyone in esports is such a pleb. They only consider you a great player if you won the championship. So whereas, Monty, what's brilliant about sports is you have two things. You have MVP and all pro nominations, and you have Hall of Fame. And what's great about those two is they can make up for when someone like a Barry Sanders never has the team to win. doesn't matter if he really is the best running back, then he can get... All pro, he could be an MVP candidate, he can get the whole thing. In esports, we're so dumb, we give you all your team acknowledgement success, and then the joke is you don't even get in the Hall of Fame. But if they were to do it correctly, Nekduk certainly would be in a European League of Legends Hall of Fame. <laughs> but before that, there's obviously tons we could get into on this one. Right, I'll say this, right? Generally, people probably don't know this. But if you ever look on my YouTube channel, I don't actually do reaction videos. In fact, even when I do a topic that's in line with a reaction video, I normally actually wait two or three days just because I find it's actually hard within one hour to know what you even think about a topic. You need time to think about it. You need even sometimes to listen to other people's thoughts and sort of digest what they're saying and see if they have an angle on it you haven't thought of. But... For the sake of the fact it's the most, it is the topic right now in Western League of Legends. We've got to address a little bit, a bit about this LS drama, right? So if people yeah. don't know, the timeline goes like this. As far as anyone outside knew, everything was going great within Cloud9. They were one of the best teams. They were actually winning everything. They were winning hearts and minds with the whole approach Ellis has taken. I actually even found, personally, a lot of the people who are like the experts I follow in the scene, but who aren't from NA, they were watching LCS in a way they haven't been for years at this point in time. It was kind of like a reason to follow the league and even see if there's something innovative going to come out of there. So anyway, out of nowhere, basically, two days ago, before they were going to play CLG Cloud9, it's just announced out of nowhere by the Cloud9 Twitter account in a very sort of like ominous way, like basically like LS is released, like bye. And then he himself, this is the weirdest part of people don't get it. He himself then, not that long afterwards, came out and also addressed that, yeah, he didn't know about it himself until four hours before, but he's been released. But then what's weird, and this is the part, the reason I think this is the most mysterious topic, maybe ever in League of Legends, is it doesn't seem like it is anything thus far that, like, for example, it doesn't seem like LS has wigged out or he's had some sort of, like, massive problems. It seems like, actually, he seems, I've never seen him as collected in a situation like this. He actually seems to be taking it very, very well and has actually sort of, I would say, gone out of his way to actually be, I would say, almost overly professional with the way he's handled, like, the departure. So at the moment, it's it's being left as though both sides are like, it's a mutual thing. As I've said in the past on this show, Monty, there's no such thing as a mutual departure like that unless it's something nothing to do with the game. Like, for example, obviously, if, say, like, his mum had died, I don't know, it's a family situation, if his mum had died and then he had decided to leave, yeah, that might be a rare scenario that could be mutual. But this seems, as far as I can tell, like, it is related somehow to do what's going on in Cloud9, I would guess. But we haven't got any clues whatsoever right now. Where are you at on this situation? So I don't know anything, just to be clear. Like, I, I know nothing about the situation, so I have to speculate like everybody else. Um, I'll just I, say, I will say the information I know is I did message LS just on the off chance it was something really serious like in his life. And he essentially just assured me, like, it's not, it's, I'm okay, don't worry about me. So I'll, all I'll say is that's the only info I can reveal. Um, I will say that um, part of why he might be amicable and composed right now is that Jack is very conflict averse as a person, uh, in my experience. And so it, it's possible that LS signed, a, you know, a termination agreement 
where he has a non-disparagement clause and he gets paid out the rest of his contract or the rest of the year on his contract, no matter what. That is something that I think Jack would do. Um, Seems likely. I, I, uh, Jack is not- Especially in terms of the stakes of, you know, moving to America for all this and doing all that right. jazz and risking everything, yeah. Jack, Jack generally likes to, you know, uh, kind of smooth over things and make sure that there isn't bad PR and he's not really afraid to spend money to do that in in my experience even a lot of money uh cloud9 is not a, an organization that typically like nickels and dimes people um so i think probably what happened is even if ls felt bad about it um there probably is, he probably is leaving with a substantial sum of money um so it yes. makes it better would be my assumption um, the other thing is that... And also, you got to tie in, like, supposedly part of the reason why this move could even happen in the first place, despite Ellis's circumstances, is that they were going to help him with his, like, residency and career. So I'd imagine also Correct. you don't want to rock the boat with that and fucking make it... You don't want that to be, like, part of, like, almost like a divorce settlement where people are grabbing different things. You want it to go as smoothly as possible in that scenario. You've got extra reasons to. Yeah, I will also say that Ellis himself tends to, even when he has been treated badly, uh kind of just take it i mean if we go back in time to like the whole t1 thing like like like, let me just put this in context so the this is just factual like we know that t1 was intending to make you make him a coach we know that basically the korean fan backlash which included extensive homophobia um was one of the reasons why it was it was targeted you know it, the reasons that were stated by the korean fans was he didn't have that experience however mixed in there on the t1 discord and through t1 social media from the korean side there was also very targeted homophobia that happened he did not really react to that in a way that i think the normal person would which is just to be you know genuinely and legitimately fucking offended uh by everything and he not only kind of took that one on the chin um but then continued to work with the entity that is t1's owner comcast because you have to remember and also like there's several layers to this and the, the whole weirdness like i'm sure we'll get into joe marsh's like responses to jack which were also just fucking strange like frankly uh basically like he's the he's the ceo of t1 he's like responding to jack and bigging up ls Ellis was already in a pretty, in my opinion, serious conflict of interest while at Cloud9 because he was making a show face check for G4. G4 is owned by Comcast, who also owns T1. So if Cloud9 were to theoretically go to a an international competition, which seems likely, like later this year, you would think, given their performance and given T1's extraordinary current performance. Certainly the worlds, yeah. They would they would be at MSI or potentially Worlds together. That seems like a likely outcome. Um, and then Ellis is suddenly on the payroll for a rival organization, which like I don't I'm surprised even that's even legal. I'm, su- I'm like I'm surprised even in like riots rules you're allowed to do that. Because here's the I thing: was, remember your premise. As well. The premise you were placed into, if people don't know, famously with Badawi and Renegades, is Riot claimed they treat any kind of a contract that says you will ever one day own a team as you currently own it. So why it wouldn't be a similar scenario with directly being paid by a competitor? I have no idea, Money. To me, that's it's, an it's obvious not, conflict of interest. You shouldn't. It's not. A, it's not only that. Duncan, like, uh, so first off, I was not in a position, you know, I, as a coach, the problem is if he was a caster, it wouldn't be an issue potentially because he can't actually affect the outcome of the games, no. right? As a coach, he could theoretically, you know, receive money. I'm not saying he things. would do this. I don't think he would do this, but this is why these, you know, conflicts of interest cannot be allowed is that he could see- theoretically be paid money by T1 to throw a game. Right. If you would do um, anything, just miss a ban. You could do it. There's a million sure. ways you could do it. And that's why, yeah, that's why essentially you can't police all these things. Like every conflict right. of interest, the more serious it is, the more you have to just not allow them to exist. Yeah. And I don't think he would do that. But I, I found it odd that Riot was willing to do that because when I owned Renegades, I promised to Riot that I wouldn't even cast an international event that Renegades was in. I said I would just recuse myself from casting like an MSI or Worlds, even though I obviously didn't think we were going to go in, there. In a way, that was sort of 5D chess. You, know, just, <laughs> you have to give it to did you? There you go. You, you, get, you, you were so, not. <laughs> so I think it's really, I think it's really fucking weird that Joe Marsh is like in here, like bigging up LS and like responding to Jack's tweets. Like, I don't, I don't understand what the purpose of this executive of T1 getting into these stupid social media 
chains is. And also, I just think it's a bad look because it was already a conflict of interest that existed previously. And who knows what this, you know, what his deal is with T1 compared to C9. Like he was getting paid by both, basically effectively both parent organizations simultaneously. And I just, I just expect better from a professional executive than to be involved in this shit. Like just message LS privately and show him your support. Like don't try and win stupid internet points. It's weird. I mean, that, as far as I know, I don't even believe that guy's a real human. He just looks like a fucking bot just trying to create clout on Twitter, mate. I've seen that guy in the last few years. It doesn't seem at all like there's a real mind behind that account. What I would say is this. This is the big issue, I think, in this scenario, is this is, no matter what, a loss for the LCS. Even if it turns out, by the way, despite the fact, obviously, LS is a friend of the show and me and Monty have a personal relationship with him beyond just esports. Even if it turns out, by the way, LS did some outrageous shit and maybe he was totally justified to be removed and maybe in that scenario, you know, there was no circumstances you could keep them on even if that it ends up all being the case like i alluded to about like the renewed interest in lcs this basically does unfortunately just completely cut the legs out under lcs this split like yeah. look you've still got the team liquid team that looks mega it'll certainly still be interesting to see what happens with the cloud 19 after ls but like this was for me the central nar narrative plank of the whole lcs this split in fact the yep. whole thing was like it was all about like not even just like will he win lcs it was like can he uh, uh, essentially it's what every idiot fan's been saying for the last five years like oh we have you're so smart why don't you coach the team it's like he was trying to mate he was actually going to do it and in fact he'd even done it in a way that every other fucker wouldn't have so when people like monty were coaches and you were all like ah so much for you knowing everything he didn't pick all those fucking players he just got given off them and then was told that you could pick like two players or something. i also couldn't control says, draft <laughs> LS, <laughs> so wasn't there draft. <laughs> legitimately had full control over everything to the extent that i even think jack went way too far like i don't know why malice had to just be allowed to be on the academy squad because you bring it on LS. So I even thought he'd give him everything. That's so, so, yeah, so yeah. Let's to me, this only lasted like three weeks or something. Like that's just so brutal. Why it's so weird, and what 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 I agree with Thorin about is that this was purpose built for LS in a team in a way that I have never seen a team be purpose built for a coach before. Right? It was like we're bringing in the players from Korea that LS wants. We're, swa we're swapping Fudge to mid lane, which LS wants. We're bringing in academy players, which LS wants. We're stacking our roster with coaches that have worked with LS in Korea or worked closely with LS in other environments. It was, And then LS is the piece that that is, he's the linchpin of this entire the thing. The, entire thing. the yes. whole concept of having regular skim scrims with the academy team, the methods of training, the people involved, the players involved. And so that's why it's so fucking surprising is it if he had just been plugged into an existing roster it kind of would have been whatever but c9 went all in like all in they went as all in as you can possibly go and he lasted four games on site in los angeles which is insane um and so i i, I think we have to say that the problem was likely pretty serious um that's the only conclusion you could reach uh it it must have been there there is a zero percent chance that it wasn't some sort of direct conflict i think with jack um because that's the only thing that could produce this result um so i don't know if it was i, I don't know what it could possibly be because as we can see as fans it certainly wasn't viewership based this was excellent for Cloud9. Look at their content. Their content went from doing very few views to like a quarter million views per episode. Everybody the reality wanted... series would have been the most popular series maybe yes. ever in the West. That would yes. have been so viewed by the end of the split. It would be mental, wouldn't it? The game viewership in LCS was up. So obviously LCS was going to be super happy with this. Um, you know, here, here's a something, Thorin, that you know people are maybe aren't talking about. He's already in L.A., I think there's a non-zero chance that another team tries to pick him up before he leaves. I that's think that's actually one thing possible. I want to bring up, though, because here's the problem. I know what you mean by that, but if I'm LS, I wouldn't do it. Because I have to say, no, no, of course not. it's only this circumstance you described as to why I even thought he did it. In the, I was, but I swear, when all the rumors start in the offseason, I actually assumed he wouldn't join. Because I remember thinking, like, mate, he's told me, like, his whole life's about getting to live in Korea as long as he can and be able to stay yep. there. And not have no, so, so it was only that they put all these incredible, like, basically, like you said, it was basically, like, the best crafted fucking deal I've ever seen. Like, the joke is, they made a deal for LS as a fucking coach 
Like back when like LeBron was going to leave the fucking Cavaliers and every team was like pitching like, we'll basically give you the entire franchise, we'll get all the players you want. Like it was like that. It was like you were doing it as though yep. like you were trying to sign Faker or something. So to me, if that's the org that did this and this didn't work out, I just don't see a world where he goes to like, well, I mean, pick any team. There's always no the team whole, he can go The, the to whole narrative on. too is that if this was like just that LS couldn't work with the team, what team can Ellis work with? Because they gave him everything, absolutely everything, to the degree that they were willing to like sponsor his very expensive visa to get permanent residency in Korea in the long run. You could not get a better deal than what Ellis had. All the coaches you want, all the players you want, uh, all the role swaps you want, all the structure you want, uh, your personal life just completely taken care of. So for me, this is it. This is just it. Like there is no... There, Ellis can never coach again unless he changes his own, if it, if it really is truly, as some of the players have implied, or some of the coaches as well, Vagar, V2, and, and Fudge, if it was really just they couldn't work together, then there isn't going to be a scenario where anyone can work with him because this was it. This, this was everything he had ever dreamed of and everything that is, and you, you said they offered too much. I agree. I think it was actually, you know, th going this all in is dangerous. Uh, on the any problem point. is, like, here's the issue. I would make a deal at that, Monty, but I would only, and these are the only people I would do it for as coaches, I would only make a deal like that if I was for real getting, like, coma. Aaron from fucking China. You know, the people who were like, like, by the way, in terms of thinkers, yeah, they're like an LS, but the track record they have is unbelievable. Like, if you if you go all in on a guy like that, history tells you they're not going to have any problems with people. They're not going to leave in half a month. They're not going to have some sort of health complication come in and spot. It's not. They're just going to be the model professionally you expect. They're going to coach. They're, it's going to become their org. That, that, that sort of coach I'd do this deal for. Because the reason I bring this up is this, right? Currently, as we alluded to at the beginning, we know nothing about the situation. I don't even have an inkling. All I did is just reach out to LS as a friend and just check is he okay as a person? Because yep, obviously I want him to be like a suicide risk or something horrible like that. He's in another country, all the rest of it. And there's a world where it could have been a health concern if people don't know. Even though I will say he's a bit of a hypochondriac as a person. He also has had loads of health problems to be fair. Yep. And the sorts of ones that if someone else hasn't had them, you just seem like you're being sort of like, oh, you're going on about that. But if you have these minor niggling things, yeah, it could get to you. But this is what I would say, right? Why people need to rewind this to before he could have joined T1 and ask why on these shows would people like me and you who like LS, why were we talking about? Actually, I don't know if this is the best move for T1. Should they sign LS? Will it be good? The reason why is this. Unfortunately, he does have a bad track record of staying in these sorts of jobs. And particularly, I would say this is one of the areas I think he's in his biggest trouble. When I think of people like LS, who I, I consider great thinkers, right? My role for LS, if it was my dream world, is I just want him to be like a fucking sage out of like like an anime or something, you know, roaming the countryside, living his little life, and then you just come to him to glean wisdom and get training. and so they, That's the sort of thing. But the problem is this, right? If I had to pick one area, Monty, he's not particularly strong in, and I say this as someone who can understand what that's like, is he's not really that strong in, like, interpersonal relationships, is he? Like, they tend to break down or have flare-ups or the bit drama. Well, the problem with that is, mate, you're the head coach of a fucking team. Again, if we want to use the Korean terminology, that's the whole job of a head coach's job. You're not the strategic coach. Remember, T1, he would have been the, the coach figure this is where you're supposed to be the guy where the idea is this just is the org is you at this point in time dude like you've got to be able to get along with everyone you've got to be able to like communicate it's not even about right or wrong it's about can you communicate your ideas to people and they know what page you're on and unfortunately that was always my concern with this deal and even with the t1 deal if it had gone through it's like unfortunately i always felt like there was a timer in the background tick 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 tick, tick like that 60 minutes fucking clock and any minute you just know it's going to go off and that's the end like you just know it can somehow i knew this couldn't last like like the joke me rich had on my show i did with him was like it's just when will it end like will it be like this split will it be two splits will he make it worlds like it never felt like it was going to be a long-term thing for me unfortunately yeah and i i think one of the issues is that you know if he was a strategic coach and it was being filtered through somebody else that would have been one thing but having him as a head coach and i don't even think it was conflict with his assistant coaches or his players i think it's it like i think it was, with you. It it was like with the, the org. org yes um, yeah. So I'm not even sure if that was a problem in this specific case, but I do think that he's a person having known him for what, like 10 years now. Um, he's a person that I don't think he ever has bad intentions, by the way. I think he is actually has good intentions basically all the time. Um, but I, I think that he, the way he expresses those intentions at times is, is 
difficult to work with. And it must have been an issue with Jack. It must have been an issue with other people at the org. And, you know, for those people bagging on Jack, I think it's important to recognize that one of Jack's greatest strengths, because he is basically the GM of the team, has been making tough decisions and repeatedly sending his teams to worlds and and seeing you know the greatest north american success of any team in in history and so you can bag on him but at the end of the day he's 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 made some really fucking hard decisions before in terms of benching star players or completely changing his roster using rookies to to great success and he is one of the best gms if not the best GM in North America. And so he must be confident that with the existing coaching staff that he has, remember, there's still Mithy, there's still Max Waldo, there's still Vagar V2, they can hire more coaches. He's got a solid group of players um, that should be able to be top three. Uh, that this is a situation where he decided that the price wasn't worth, um, you know, the 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 it's outcome. Key, that is outcome the thieves now, but the rest of oh, Mithy, yes, 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 sorry. Right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of precedent to say that Jack can still be successful this year or successful enough, let's say. Obviously, I think the ceiling has gone down in terms of what they can do. It's really disappointing because as a viewer, I was really excited to see a lot of LS's theories in action. It was really fun, frankly, to watch how they were drafting and the strategies they were using in the first couple of weeks of play. And so, and his personality, I think, brought a lot to the league. So, from a viewer perspective, it just fucking sucks. Um, it's really disappointing, uh, and it, I think it takes a lot of the wind out of the sails of the LCS overall. And certainly, Riot must be furious uh, about this decision because I think it was contributing significantly to viewership. Um, but yeah. By the way, on that topic of like, because if people haven't noticed, I know what morons are going to say. They're going to go, this just shows your bias. You hate TSM and would rag on them, but you will not say about Cloud9. You know, as I point out every time, that's because the track records show that Cloud9 and TSM aren't in any way alike. The only fucking connection is that Jack actually helped Reginald with his business before he made his fucking own. That's about the only tenuous connection between them. Because here's the problem, right? As Monty says, the difference is this isn't something new from Cloud9. There was a period, I would say, off the top of my head, I would put it at around like season eight for me basically just before um was it actually actually i think that was the, the first split of franchising for me is when actually cloud nine changed their approach because before that they actually if anything were the org that was super sentimental they would hold on to players for a long time or they would let players that probably aren't good enough stay in the team etc but for me the day that they let jensen go to team liquid that was when they actually became the super decisive cloud nine that have taken all the hard decisions you're talking about they let jensen go they let they got they chose between Iron fucking Reaper. svenskeren and blabber when svenskeren was the mvp and you know yep. what? They were right. Blabber's already won more fucking MVPs. That, that's ridiculous. Like, the point is, Jack genuinely has taken three or four massive moves. And even if in the short term they backfired, they didn't in the long run. Actually, he made the tough choices. He had Reaper, but guess what? He had Reaper during the time it was right. And then eventually, even though it was a split after he won the championship, he caught him. It was the right time to let him go. It wasn't uh, the right team for him and he wasn't the right atmosphere. Got perks, ran it into top eight at Worlds, uh, let perks go, you know, the greatest Western player of all time. Like he knows, he knows when people are done and when to cut his losses. And he is, I think, very prescient about uh, how, like uh, the longevity of people and their level of motivation. And all I'll say is that, it, I mean, you can look at this. I've done interviews with Reaper where Reaper himself has said this on some of the Cloud9 content when I was when I was working with Cloud9. So it's not like I'm spoiling anything. But when Reaper was with the team, he admitted to being burnt out at Worlds and underperforming and not working as hard as he could have. And because he admitted that, Jack brought him back. <laughs> you know, And he came back and it was only after... I think that burnout continued. Uh, Reaper, you know, I think sure had the best intentions of, of you know, kind of upping his game once again. And I guess Jack didn't feel like that has happened. It was only then. So like Reaper tried to, you know, I think his attitude was very self-reflective. I think Jack does give people a lot of second chances if they're honest and about the situation and willing to change. And so I, I just have to imagine that given what I know about how he's managed coaches, especially Reaper in the past, that there must have been something, there must have been a really profound disagreement that Jack said, 
there is a 0% chance that this attitude will ever change or this approach will ever change. And so we have to cut it now because that has not, that really has not been Jack's attitude in the past towards his coaches. Also, by the way, for people who are wondering, because I know there's a lot of people who've been playing this game of like, oh, better be careful what you say. What if it ages badly? First of all, fuck off this generation with this whole aging thing. Y'all all do it before it's even fucking finished. I had morons. The most best example ever I've told you is the one where I made a tweet about how like fucking top esports was going to beat Fnatic. And Fnatic fans messaged me the whole series until they lost the series and then just stopped messaging. So it hadn't even finished aging. I hadn't even been born yet. And they're like, this is aged well. This is aged well. And then when they lost, they just were like, I guess I shouldn't tweet now because it has aged well. Like, so anyway, we all know that's just nonsense as it is. But this is one of the reasons why I'm not actually worried about speculating on this topic. Because if it was something simple, Monty, like he has some sort of visa problem in Korea, if there's some sort of problem where he can't stay in America, like he can't, you know, he, he's too homesick. And then he just said that. There wouldn't be the, there wouldn't be this, vi this like fucking Poirot no. intro, like they're in a locked room and no one knows why, but the, the people are dead and everyone has a reason why, but who will it be like? It wouldn't be like that. This actually suggests by the way that at the moment in Cloud9 HQ they're fucking scrambling figuring out what is our take on this how are we going to even present this and in fact the fact that they haven't even given a hint like no tweets from Jack etc suggests to me that like this is a really serious thing but they want to be super careful how they message it so I would imagine it is something like we've been implying like there's some sort of impasse between the most important people in Cloud9 and LS therefore there is no there is no way they can continue and so they've just cut their losses right at the very beginning by the way I will say even though in general I'm not a fan of like cutting any player or coach this early like in my opinion if you sign up for them and you know what you're getting into you should give them like the split in my opinion you should yep. give them essentially a chance to course correct figure things out blah 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 all the rest even so if you really do if you are Jack or someone at Cloud9 and you really do think this just cannot work for the year and it's definitely not going to get me to where my goals were where even though I spent all this money I wanted to maybe I wanted to make the final of the worlds or I thought I was going to win MSI or something if I really know that isn't right it's actually better to just cut the losses now you better you may as well just yes. get, get going now because you still got so but, much time before worlds that you can fix this i really just think that people should not take the the approach of jack being an asshole this was a very costly decision so for neither jack. neither sides it, are assholes who this, knows right yeah yeah this oh, both? this decision cost jack potentially millions and millions of dollars uh millions of dollars that he probably had to pay for ls's visa for his salary for his buyout probably on his contract or, you know, to make him go away amicably. Um, the player cost of bringing all these players that LS wanted, um, which potentially another coach might not want or well, Jack well, may, may not want. Um, there's also the issue of, um, you know, the sponsor, the loss of sponsorship value, the, the, the viewership yes. on their content is going to go significantly down. Those are numbers that their sales team would be selling against. So like, this is not some sort of knee-jerk uh, idle decision that Jack or, or the organization has made. And I think that you have to rec you just have to realize that Jack would have to be very petty in a way that I have never seen him in my entire decade of knowing Jack Etienne um, to make this call because the expense to him is extreme. Uh, and he doesn't, I don't think he makes these decisions lightly. Yeah, there's another thing people don't realize. You're not even just doing the plus minus on LS. As you said, considering he built this team, and I'll go further than you, it's not even like maybe another coach wouldn't want this. There's no coach in the world who would ask for exactly these five players, Monty. Nobody. Like, you've got a fucking role swap. You've got Koreans mixed in with, like, native NA players. You've got super problematic players, like fucking Blabber mixed with Koreans who play a stat. Like, nobody would ask for this team. So you've even also, there's, like, an implied value burn where whatever coach you now bring in is, like, I mean, I'll do what I can, but it's not like I would pick these bloody players, is it? That's why, if anything, I think the Max Waldo angle, that's probably the approach, mate. You probably just stick with that. Pick someone internally who agreed with these players. Because I I think even traditional coaches, this is the ultimate get out of jail free card. You could bring me in, but at the end of the day, I could always just go, you had a bloody role swap top laner as a mid laner, Korean guy didn't speak. Like, there's a million angles on this. So I, I even think you have... That, that's why to me this has to be somewhat enormous mate because this isn't just a normal gamble this isn't like you fire it's not like when TSM fire a coach at a laugh but then path takes over and they win a split and go to world that, that isn't what's happening with this this is way more serious the one other thing I would say as well is this and this is the one problem I do have overall with this move right now 
is I also get the vibe, quite frankly, if you look at who's been public and said stuff like, as you said, a lot of people within Cloud9 have sort of said something publicly, but only that they support LS and sort of nice things, or they've made like a very a, a vague allusion to there was some sort of disagreement if you look at the discords, etc. Right? The one problem I have is this, is if the team really did buy in, like there wasn't any play, like remember there's a world also, fans will never know this, where if a pro player is smart, he doesn't himself come out and just say something against his coach. You go to the order privately and you just get the message out there and they never have to know you were involved. That doesn't seem to be what it is, right? It seems to me like all the people involved in Cloud9 minus the ownership group thought this was a great idea. I'll also worry about that, by the way, is even though they are pros and you still have to play with whoever's your coach, I would worry that they won't play for the new coach in the same way they did for LS. That would be my main concern, you know, with the way this project was set up, you know. I think it's probably very disappointing for a lot of the players and coaches who probably came there because of LS to then just stare down a year that they're not going to have him. I mean, they got him on site in person for just a couple of weeks because he wasn't there during lock-in, right? The full roster wasn't even there during lock-in. So obviously I would think it would be hugely uh, disappointing to the players. Hugely I think the problem I have is this, unless he can go back to Korea and at some point get a, a gig like the T1 gig, in my opinion, I don't think coaching is for LS. Like, I actually think he has an amazing no. mindset for the game. I just don't think, like, the funny thing is, I actually think content creation is his fucking wheelhouse. Like, it's because yep. essentially it's all about how you the present thing is, your he doesn't ideas. want it to be, Thor. And like, that's, that's what a lot of people are like. Uh, you know, he has, he has in these spots. If people don't know, every analyst in esports secretly wants to be a play by play, a fucking color commentator. Everyone has some other vision of what they should be doing than what they're doing currently for some reason or what they're good at, you know. Uh, you know, and we know that LS almost certainly took pay cuts to be the coach of Cloud9. Oh, I'm sure because there's no way yeah. he could make as much money at Cloud9 as he, he was making streaming. That's just like the economics of coaching in League of Legends versus a streamer at his level doesn't make any sense. And he'll go back to streaming, although probably with you know fewer lesser viewership due to the fact that co-streaming is no longer allowed in LCS. Uh, but it uh, you know he's got to figure out his life and what the next step is. He certainly has plenty of money to last for years, if not the rest of his life at this point in time, because the combination of his streaming money, plus what I assume were very substantial payouts from T1 and, and C9 over basically not coaching, weirdly, I think he got paid massive amounts of money to not coach a team twice. Um, I, I think he's fine. I think he can you know, figure out what he wants his next steps to be. I hope he goes back into content creation. He's certainly very entertaining and uh, lots of people enjoy his insight and commentary. Is there anything else we want for this section? Was there anything else went on at the moment? Because obviously that's I mean, obviously been dominated the, everything for the last two days. But I, before it, that, it sort of, let me think. It, it overtook the TSM nonsense. <laughs> and you know what's sad, by the other. way? <laughs> it, here's the saddest thing of all, by the way. I've pointed this out previously, but like it, it actually has gone over the Rubicon, Monty. It's gone over the line where like... It's not actually that funny that TSM shit because they're just really bad now, and there's no real. And here's the other thing: there's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no way they get out of this, as far as I can tell. Like people don't get it. I genuinely do. Like if you, they have to be relevant for it to be funny. Their shit. If they actually do become like CLG and they're just a bottom feeder, who cares at that point? Like it's not even. We the joke is we won't even bother mentioning them anymore. Eventually we'll just stop. Like it just won't even matter, will it? <laughs> no, and, and we discussed this before. It's you know half their fans already left with Bjergsen. And then I assume a few more of the Reggie apologists finally got it through their heads that his behavior is not worth cheering on, even though it took a fucking decade uh, of video evidence. I guess maybe for some people, it, it finally dawned on them that they shouldn't be supporting this org. Uh, but yeah, I think it's I think TSM is in a very bad shape. Apparently they got rid of one of their coaches as well. Uh, yeah, the, the players that they recruited don't seem to be integrating very well into the team. If we look at the, the C9 TSM game that happened on uh, yesterday, um, you know, I would have thought that TSM, like, first off, I think the whole thing is just extremely confusing what they're doing because they play two enchanter tops for, for Hooney this week, which just I think goes to show that they don't understand or don't care who Huni is as a player because he's not the player I would put on enchanter top laners. Um, not to say he can't do it, but I think that when you have a lot of new players and communication issues on the team playing contact, like very complex strategies like that and not putting Huni in a position to carry and trying to all in on tactical. And by the way, they should have lost 
both of the games, I think, that, that happened this this past weekend. <laughs> no, wait, just, the, just the idea that their, their game plan is to all in on tactical. <laughs> yes, by the Sean, way, which is Sean, also... Please, Reggie, which please. Is also, come on, which is come also on, just insane. Know. Guys. That's where we're at. Remember, That's where we're at in 2022. You're all in on tactical. Remember that... Tactical is the player that was replaced by Team Liquid for Han Sama, which obviously who wouldn't do that? That's just a straight upgrade, right? If you have the if you have the available position uh, to put a an import into, but you know, I, I if you're if you're in a position where tactical you believe that tactical doing seventy percent of your team's damage on Jinx is the best way to win a game, these are dire fucking straights for TSM guys. Like that's Dude, I said that's this bad. when I said this when he was actually on Team Liquid, but when he was actually considered like a prospect when he replaced Doublelift. But I even said he's playing with fire already, Monty. If you know the power of names, that he calls himself tactical and he plays a role where you cannot int. Right, you are begging, you are begging for the meme gods to slap you down. And then what does it turn out? His biggest flaw as a player is he fucking ints all the time. Except the joke is it's never a tactical int. It's just an int, isn't it? Like, give me a break. And then a lot, and also, I made this point before, Monty, but other people won't appreciate this because they didn't follow the League of Legends game long enough. You know, famously, I always used to say that the dumb thing about Reggie is he didn't even exploit a loophole he had where he had Bjergsen grandfathered in as an NA resident. And he didn't even stack the team with two imports every year he had a couple way tried like Sven and Mithy but aside from that he would usually waste an import slot and one of the reasons famously you remember this he used to say for years he didn't want Korean imports he didn't believe that you should essentially bring them in because you have to speak a different language blah 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 now the joke is his team was the least successful of all the major western teams even the ones that signed bloody Koreans like Cloud9 and then even better than that you wait all those years you don't sign Koreans during the period that by the way Koreans are straight fire like season 5 to season season seven then you go actually fuck it sign sodar because he speaks chinese and so does lena oh lena's left just sign more chinese player what even is this so you waited 10 years and then at the end when you could have had pigler you know actually fucking good asian players you're just signing no namers from china now you don't even have lena which was the whole angle that apparently she spoke chinese like i don't even know what this team is the reason why i find it so sad monty is because if people don't know i actually think cares who's like their general manager or whatever now i think he actually is a really good mind for the game yes, but is. i really wonder does he have any input like what is he working with when he's in this team because these don't feel like players he would sign me i look they they said they did this whole scouting thing in china but the, like oh, you're saying man. so here's here's the thing i think we're, what we're seeing now is how hard bjergsen was propping up tsm not only in terms of his own play but drawing other players into the organization because as we can see when left to their own devices the gming of ts like their gm literally just quit Yes. I, you know, and they apparently were doing these boot camps, uh, you know, over in Asia where they were testing all these players during the offseason. And for this to be the result, even though Spica, their jungler, is bilingual, like I it's it's inconceivable that an org with the resources of TSM just shits out a roster like this one. Uh, and there really isn't any hope like who you, you have. A Huni in the top lane who's notoriously streaky, who's notoriously unreliable. Sure, he's got great highs, but he also has extremely low lows. Uh, and you have Tactical, who has never displayed great carryability. And then you have Spica, who's coming off, you know, an MVP performance, but certainly hasn't looked I'm like I mean, this who, who, who is who is Spica propping up on this roster? Like, even if he's great. There's got to be somebody to carry these games, and it's not Spica on Udyr, I'll tell you that. So then then you just have this revolving, you know, these revolving uh, support players, you know, Shen Yi being randomly benched, and then inexplicably, by the way, with a, an announcement that doesn't even really tell you what's going on, because it's like, I need a fucking Rosetta Stone to understand the English language that they're trying to use to tell me what's going on with the team. Is it permanent? Is it temporary? What the hell is actually going on? It feels like there's no plan and there's no management within this team. And the people who made the decisions about this roster are gone, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and the difference is, while well, LS probably made the decisions about the, the current C9 roster, at least the pieces of the C9 roster are individually good. Like, this is a team that you could see how good Summit is 
in their game against TSM. And you know what? I thought TSM might actually win that game, not only because of the mass. Actually, I should rephrase this. It wasn't a massive lead. It was a massive kill lead. It was only about a 1,200 gold lead in the early game, which isn't really sufficient to cover up how much money Summit was was getting on the Camille. Um, but you could also see the difference between the Immortals game and the Cloud9 game between Revenge's Camille and Summit's Camille. Summit is, a, you know, he he knows the limits of the champion a lot better. He was willing awesome. to push them a lot more. The way he ended that game was fucking spectacular from an individual play perspective. When he was pressuring the Nexus, diving the rise, maximizing the pressure, then just TP, recall TPing right back into the fight at the Dragon. He played it extremely well. And I thought TSM might win because... I was thinking, well, this is probably a good strategy to use against C9 when they don't necessarily have a, they went through this turmoil of their head coach moving over and they have a roster that can't fully communicate with each other based on the Korean and English. And it is hard to make very fast decisions in a weird meta where, you know, it's basically kind of like a lane swap and Summit obviously has, has probably played those before, Revenge not so much, which probably was another factor. Um... But you look at this scenario and you say, okay, this this requires significant communication from Cloud9. I'm not sure if they're up to the task against, you know, with their mixed language roster, with their coach just leaving, and they still pulled it out. So that actually gave me more respect uh, and hope for C9 moving forward, because I think that's about as tough as it's going to get for them. Yes, it is absolutely done, though. But who gives a fuck at this point? <laughs> Luckily, here's the good news. As mad as it is, like on the one hand, they, it will. I'll, I'll be honest. Narratively, it does suck because they obviously were like the evil empire, weren't they? But I will say, luckily, and this might sound like a crazy statement of state, but LCS doesn't need TSM anymore. They don't. Like at this nope. point in time, they don't need them to attract talent. The talent already goes to all the teams in LCS. They don't need it in terms of like they're a huge. They are, they, everyone has fucking investment in LCS. In fact, if you look in a world where we've got hundred thieves, Cloud Nine, Team Liquid, Evil Genius. You say, you're like mate, those, that's it that's all we need you don't need three teams for worlds that those four teams can decide amongst themselves and then there's even the outside world where maybe a dignitas or someone can just get it together and be a dark horse like at this point as much it, it would have been really brutal if three or four years ago tsm was this shit it actually doesn't matter now boys i'm telling you it doesn't really matter it doesn't. especially since you know eg it seems like they're finally getting their brand identity under control which was kind of a disaster for a number of years they they weren't really leaning into i think their strengths it feels like they're doing that a lot better right now uh fly quests branding i think it's not my favorite but they have an identity that they've been cultivating over time and uh, you know it, i think they're just other teams that are that are frankly like more fun and more interesting and tsm doesn't even have really I speak because like really they're only, I guess who needs a good personality too, but it just feels like they're not very forward with those personalities on the team. And, you know, I, I've said this before, but when your brand identity is winning and winning goes away, you better have fucking something else to fall back on. Uh, and they don't, they have nothing. They, you know, they, they, their brand identity right now is pretty negative given the investigation that's going on with their ownership and, and the information that's come out of, from the team and by the way right. th there's something we could even get into as well one thing i do hate in league is people love to take narratives and when they sort of sex the narrative up they then forget and make it reality so you know people act monty like reggie's some marketing genius and you know he knew how to sort of like essentially they try to make him sound like when floyd mayweather became like fucking you know when he switched from being like money mayweather where he was just like an up and coming really good fighter to like where, where he attends he's a troll now and he, he tries to make it so that either you watch him because you think he's the best or you watch him because you want to see him lose. That's like his whole gimmick, right? The di people act like that's what Reginald was doing the whole time. He isn't. And here's how you know. Because if he was, this is exactly when actually, or Reginald, you don't take a step back. The years when you had really good teams is when you, you take a step back and you yep. delegate. Now, if anything, Reginald should be front and center. Like if I were him for real, I would actually use this to make that why people care about TSM. I'd be like, I'll pick this team myself. In fact, I scouted the Shinny. I'd do that. I'm glad make it so. But there's some reason for people to watch at the moment that's why it's essentially the, the problem is like, like i said tsm just aren't relevant mate. who gives a fuck it's just a bad team with a bunch of players that have shown no promise that just probably won't be very good basically the only players to care about as you said is speaker and honey and even then 
I don't really care that much about Hooney anymore, mate. Like, in LCS, okay, he's all right. But, like, I've seen him play internationally, mate. I don't really give a fuck about him going to Worlds or MSI. So, yeah, the team's just irrelevant at this point. And the reason why it is sad, though, I will say, is because if they'd actually had their shit together and this whole LS thing hadn't happened, this on paper, if TSM was a good team, could be one of the best LCS splits ever. Like, you would have real... You could have four... As it said, like, could go four or five teams deep for the champion. Whereas instead, we're probably going to go, like, two teams deep, if not one, and it'll probably uh, end up not being as good, right? I mean, I think it's really hard, now that Core JJ is back, uh, to bet against Team Liquid. I, guess, yeah, I think it's exciting. Not even just this split, mate. I don't think fans still get this, Monty. This is how bad people are with narratives in League. Core JJ getting a green card is like the final fucking it, like Infinity Stone going in the gauntlet, you <laughs> no. morons. They now can sign another import and have Core JJ, yeah. right? I know you're not going to get this because you all still think it's Bjergsen. Spoiler, it hasn't been for four years. Core JJ is the most OP player in LCS anyway, and he is now counted as a fucking NA player. That is well, they so... Have on Blip, though. <laughs> they have had some input, though. No, but the, the promise is, like, in the future, you can always have two imports and core JJ, mate. This could, yep. you, if you put it together properly, if your team look good, you've still got a couple of years' window on this, and you could just run the table in LCS from yeah. here on out. I mean, the fact that Bjergsen, Santorin, and Core are now. Are now oh, he is fucking it. Come on. Yeah, it's it's crazy that, that they have these three players that count as as NA residents. Just keep um, that core. So you... Literally, every year if you wanted, you could keep that core and just go, right, next year, you know what? Maybe Hans Summer didn't work out, Monty. So you know what? Maybe next year I sign like comp from Rogue and I sign like fuck. You know what I mean? You could just put anyone you want in there, can't you? It's ridiculous how OP this combo could be. Yeah. Um I I think like uh, it's it's really really it would have been even in a world where you know LS was here the the pound for pound strength of that roster is just nuts right now. Oh, I mean Bjergsen Bjergsen basically doesn't even have to do anything. He said it himself in an interview this weekend where uh, you know Hans Sama and Core are doing such a great job. I mean Core obviously very small sample size, but Core in what two games I believe has like a ninety percent. Uh, kill he has eighty nine point seven percent kill participation. He Makes is sense fucking he was still a player. everywhere on the map. Yeah. The amount of pressure this guy exerts, the amount of summoners he blows in other lanes, his timings on the roams, his ability to two v two in the lane. This guy is extremely valuable and extremely good. It's why Bjergsen wanted to go play with him overall. Um, so yeah, but, you know, it's I think it's I think it's really really tough. Um, to beat Team Liquid, and it would have been even in a world where some of these other teams didn't face the issues that have caused their rosters or coaching staffs to to collapse. So I mean, it looks like it's going to be another pretty dominant year for Team Liquid. Obviously, the hype around EG has cooled off somewhat. Um, FlyQuest is fraudulent, in my opinion. No, there's no universe that's staying at the top of the league. God. Look who they played. I, Look, I will say on paper, TSM was supposed to be good. But aside from that, who gives a fuck about who they beat? They just beat all the other bad teams, haven't they? haven't played anyone good yet. It's mental. Well, Fly, FlyQuest, like FlyQuest beat 100 Thieves yesterday. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, they did win that one, true. But... <laughs> Still I mean, they shouldn't have won well. that game. Like, uh, the only thing I'll say is that, look, you have to look through at the steps it took for FlyQuest to win that fucking game. So first off, they fall back to a 5K gold deficit. Um, we On the current patch, bounties are, are easier to achieve, right? So they get gold bounties. They get a gold bounty immediately before they take down top turret. So the timing was absolutely perfect for them to get back into the game. Then they get a kill in mid lane and then they get dragon, which immediately shaves because of bounties and because of a kill 2000 gold off of the lead that hundred thieves had. And then on top of that, it took Abadage having a horrific game, just a stinker of a game on Corky mispositioning constantly. Um, to throw away the lead. And then even then it took kind of miracle team fights, a very extended late game where they were still on the cusp of losing um, multiple times for them to actually come away with that win. And they've had a couple of these games where it, they easily could have lost and probably should have lost. Um, and so we're looking at a team that's five and one, but could could easily be three and three.
Think um, how ridiculous this is, right? Fucking FlyQuest has beaten EG and Team Liquid, but then they've lost to Fly... No, sorry, 100 Thieves has beaten EG and Team Liquid, but lost to FlyQuest and Immortals. Like, at this point, does 100 Thieves just go into the server and go... I will play at exactly your level, and then we will see who will win. Like, are, they, are these fuckers just making, like, is it like playing golf where you essentially, like, handicap it so both people can have fun or something? Is that what 100 Thieves game is like? What the fuck is this? Like, logically, you shouldn't be the top team in the whole league with that record. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think, like, FlyQuest is probably going to be a decent team, right? But I think that the hype coming in on them... Look at that roster. Apply, no, if you apply like the, best the, the, the luck well and the eye test. There's no way. There's no way. Come on, mate. That, there's no universe that roster can be the, the best in the LCS. Not even close to it. Come on. Like, listen, I'll give them an outside chance. Maybe they can be like a really cool, like, fourth or fifth best team. Okay. There's a world where that's not impossible. I just don't buy it. Come on, man. This is like, this was put together by a blind man. <laughs> just looks like someone randomly, <laughs> it looks like someone was kept opening Leaguepedia pages and just going, him. <laughs> Tuka, Tuka Lil fucking hell I never even heard of him alright um, jo Josie Diodic we already had him well whatever just keep him I guess but, it doesn't, it's nonsense isn't it what the fuck you, dude Kumo like sorry just Kumo alone disqualifies this to ever be the champion of LCS there's no way I'm saying that already there's no way he's okay at best okay well, uh, FlyQuest also... He's just okay. He's just okay. FlyQuest also has played a couple games of, like, Kubo Enchanter Top, which probably is is good for them. Uh, and people will say, oh, but Monty, didn't you see the Trindamir game where he beat 100 Thieves? Dude, Abadage played those, like, scenarios with Trindamir, honestly, just, just fucking terribly. Like, so disrespectfully in terms of getting into Trindamir's range not accounting for a full rage bar and the amount of crit damage that he was going to do. Uh, it, it, you know, he, uh, it was baffling, frankly, the way, the way Abadage played. So, um, <laughs> like, he's not even, like, I don't even think he's a good trend. I think Abadage just fucking played bad. <laughs> so like, I don't, I don't know what to think about this roster, but I, I agree. Like people, people are, are definitely, um, too high on FlyQuest right now. I don't, I think that, you know, all things will even out in the end with this roster. Uh, I think they, it's not saying that they're going to be bottom of the league, but these results are, this is, these, these results are fraudulent. They are, they are big time fraudulent right now. But well, luckily, there's an amazing team in, in LCS Monty. It's called CLG, because this is how amazing this roster is. So they've got Jenkins Toplin, who Team Liquid lied to you and said was actually a really good player who deserved a spot in the LCS. They have Contract as a jungler, who everyone was telling me last year, remember, was better than Sven Skaren and probably should stay in Evil Geniuses. They've got Parla Fox mid laner. I was told was the truth. They're going to be the best Cloud9 mid laner ever. Smiley never got to play for Cloud9. Then we've got Luger, who even gives a fuck. He's named after a cool German pistol. That's all we know about him. And then you've got Poom, who everyone in 100 Thieves told you was the truth, the future, definitely going to be amazing, probably MVP candidate one day. Spite, surprisingly, none of these orgs want to keep any of these players, and when you put them all into a super exordia, it's fucking dog shit, the worst team in the whole league, so shout out to everyone for the fake narratives. You know, one thing in general, by the way, I'm so fucking beyond jaded by, is when teams kick a player they don't want to sign, and they gaslight you, he's so amazing, they're sad to let him go. It's like, you know what, mate? Fuck you. You've just shown by your actions you don't want him, but you want me to sign him. Yeah, so I can be bottom of the league like CLG while you look like the good guy for fuck's sake. What the fuck is that? What is that shit, mate? That's just fucking dark. Like, yeah, I just think of these kids like, fucking hell, just say they're just fucking slapping you on the arse as you go out the door. What's that about? What, what I what I love is also when when Jack bundles these players together, it's like the 2008 financial crisis and Jack is just like bundling together like high risk mortgages and then just selling them into other teams and then just fucking shorting them. It's it's. Absolutely hilarious. Only, only, only someone from your era will remember this, unfortunately, but I'll say it anyway. He essentially has mastered whatever technique they used to use back with the DVD slash video cassette era. You know when they'd sell you like two two films? They would always do it like that, wouldn't they? One film's a film you want, and then the other one, it's almost like, nah, I guess I guess that'd be all right, wouldn't it? It's never two good films, is it? Because that wouldn't make any sense. You'd sell them separately. But as you say, Monty, it's always sort of like, but I do want this one film enough that like, maybe I'd watch that other one like... 
That's essentially <laughs> how he does it with every one of those package deals. It's so incredible. It's so incredible. You have to make it just borderline enough, though. It has to be <laughs> like you sort of would watch the other movie because because essentially you talk yourself into what you need the main one, don't you? Like That's what you're doing. You're just talking yourself into the deal. You're going, I, but I really want for Zazel or whatever, but I really just want Zazel in the... T- I guess it was Fence Gare in that case, but you know. I just, I just, it just cracks me up every time. And I don't think, I don't think Jack did it this year, but it was with the whole like Palafox you know, combo yeah. package, you know, what he loads sold FlyQuest last year. You know, it, it's, he really is just like bundling up subprime players and then selling them to you and then short, shorting you. <laughs> He just said, he just Jack and the Beanstalks, and he just sells you a bunch of magic beans. Like, this would probably be amazing. I almost don't want to let these go, but you know what? I really need this cow. And then you just get the fucking magic beans. The joke is, there is no beanstalk in this scenario. So he's fucking, just nothing. It just grows into a little shrub. And you're like, what the fuck? And then he's just like, always remember to check the small print. Buyer beware. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you just don't. I just, why, why do people throw it? Why do people keep buying these I things from Jack? Like, how he can't keep getting away with it? it. Here's what the premise is. And I'll reference this because obviously this short jumped the shark and is fucking appalling now. But in the first two seasons when Rick and Morty was actually pretty funny, there's that episode, I don't know if you've seen it, the one where basically oh, yeah. they go into like an antique shop and the guy runs the yes. antique shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, the, the idea is everything's cursed. That's what Jack's like sales are like. What well, you should really ask yourself is this, why does Jack want to give me this good player? That's what he never asked himself, is it? Like they always, you're always getting wrecked. You have to understand that you're always getting wrecked. Always. <laughs> yeah, that that is fucking hilarious. I right, obviously we're gonna good. talk. We're gonna talk about LEC. Obviously, we nuked up, but I thought we'd get the LCS topics out of the way. We'd hit the big one with LS, etc. People don't know two things. One, at the end of the show, we will have viewer questions, and two, even though actually we haven't officially done it yet, tomorrow I'll basically announce who won that competition, the Shocks Art Contest. We already did a video on this channel that was us reviewing the best pieces. We'll announce the winners, and we'll contact everyone and give them all the prizes in case people are wondering. We just had some personal stuff that sort of held that up a bit, but we're gonna get it all done now. And oh, by the way, Shocks is already back. If you've been following LEC so that's cool right that'll be we'll do a break now we'll bring nuke duck on he'll this producer guy will play that fucking song where everyone's now you're all pretending like i love fucking sea shanty he's like we were doing that in 2014 back when you all thought i was gonna say back when you all thought we were racist and what was fired it's like narrow it down thorin what year are we talking about here mate? <laughs> well it's not, it's not really one year that that happened but anyway yeah we'll see after the break and it all oh, for me grog me grog and grog and grog whatever <laughs> right we're back we're joined by Nuke Doc of Excel. So, first question: Why do you hate Advien? No, obviously, yeah. if people don't know, Nuke Doc here plays for Excel, has been for the last few splits. And the first topic we should address is this topic, because basically, there's a situation where last split, if people remember, partway through the split, they brought in Advien and Marcoon, these Dutch support jungle duo. They brought them in. They looked like they sort of turned Excel around a little bit. They were in the position to maybe make the playoffs. They didn't. Then in this split, the split started not very well in terms of record. A few weeks in, Adrian was removed, and he did also do a twit longer way. It was sort of like he he t- this way, he sort of won over the community. I feel like he did like he phrased it in a way where it sounded like he was screwed over a bit and maybe didn't get a chance. But the player, to be fair, that he was being replaced by is Mickey X, who was like a many time LEC champion, MSI champion, blah blah blah. So let's just start with that topic, Nuke Ducks. People are going to want to talk about it anyway. Like, give us your thoughts yeah. on it. Like. It was implied, I remember, I saw by Patrick's statement, it was almost implied like the org made the move and not the players or something. Can you tell us anything about this move? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so the, um, uh, as far as I know, the decision was made by the coaches and the management and uh, they didn't want to talk about it with the players because they knew that like the whole team is like uh, pretty good friends. Uh, so uh, they thought that we would, uh, we could, we, it would be hard for us to be like, you know, um, not biased um so but in my opinion um it was a good move uh because mikex won the best sports in europe of course uh so you know while there was not like uh, advent was like the like the main problem of the team and there was look they were not like i think looking to replace him it was more that you know mikex was available and they thought it would be a good idea and i i think that they did the right choice, and I also think that they did the right choice not asking us because the team you was not doing. What sounds like right? Um, I'm sounds not sure. Like what... team collectively, people would have said, "Let's stick with Advien, probably right." Um, yeah, I, that could have definitely happened because also we didn't play that well the first two weeks. Um, 
and uh, it was not like it was his uh, fault or anything. I think everyone kind of played bad and it's very it would feel very bad to feel like you know you didn't perform your best and then you tell you know your team that they should replace your friend uh, when you also feel like you didn't uh, perform uh, so I think overall they they handled it uh, well uh, despite yeah I mean of, of course it sucks for Advent but yeah, of course. Um, but that's just how, how it is uh, they want to get the like, best team possible and, and try to win. So. Right, Monty, yeah. I want to get your take on this because this is actually a, a topic we could spin out a little bit, which is essentially, this is always going to be a really unpopular move. I'll give you an example, Monty. This actually just happened in CSGO as well. In CSGO, there's a team, Virtus Pro, which is from the CIS region, it's Eastern European team. And basically, they already had like a pretty good team, but their team had dropped in the rankings at say they were like the 11th best team or something. And because earlier in 2021, they'd been like one of the best teams, like say like the fifth best team, they made a big move right before the major, the World Championship in Counter-Strike, where they took out the player that on paper was the worst player and they put in like a promising player who had like real talent right even though they did end up actually making like top eight of the major they're now actually still in kind of eight at the moment they're like one of the best teams in the world the fans were super against this because not only did they not like that this player who was like a well-loved player was removed but also it was implied publicly that the org didn't ask the players permission in fact in their case i remember it was something like they just sort of like said it to the players and the players were sort of like i don't have an opinion either way like you just do what you think's right so the sidebar is this month I know a lot of fans and I noticed from talking to even people like Dom who are from the player perspective they all want it to be that the players get to decide who's in the team because their whole vibe is like you know they're the ones playing the game like what if you don't feel comfortable with the guy you play with I want to get your takes I feel like you're in Mark camp further mate like I personally think if you're like the millionaire fucking owner of the team and the coaches that's like you're the people who actually will get judged by whether the team lives or dies like you're the ones who make the investment I think you should make the choice personally I think it should be more like sports you know I, so I think that there's there's kind of two there's there's different schools of thought. Like I can tell you that m the way that I ran Renegades was very vertical, because even though there there are sp obviously sports and esports owners with different levels of game knowledge. When I was running Renegades, I had excellent game knowledge. You know what I mean? Uh, but even then, because I wasn't there, I was in Korea day to day. I would just translate everything directly down through the coaching staff and allow them to make decisions because ultimately I would be the one making decisions kind of in a vacuum. So I was trying to back up my coaches. Now, you know, there are, there are managers that, and also I think you destroy your coach's authority. Basically you do what TSM does when Reggie just like walks in the room is that you undermine all of your coach's authority when you try and directly manage a team. But at the same time, I think you have to, you know, you should be checking with your coaches, but you also have an obligation. And this is kind of what Jack does, which is like when something's not working on a roster with cloud nine, historically he, or even if it looks like it's working fine, but if there's interpersonal issues, he will, he will make adjustments very quickly. And it doesn't sound like obviously from what Nuke Duck's saying and from what I understand that there were interpersonal issues before. And I think what's interesting about this particular move is that last year I said that I, I tweeted like that the, the improvement you saw when two rookies, Markun and, and Advienne, were added to XL was incredible. It was immediately noticeable. Rare to see two rookies performing at that level. Obviously nice to bring them in both in when they had an established synergy already that they could translate that jungle support synergy onto the map. But you would have thought that basically not even a full split of play, you would have given perhaps a little more leash. However, I think there are extraordinary circumstances and when a player of Mickey X's expertise comes available, you like it's one of those situations where you're hoping Advn becomes a Mickey X. So like, why not just get Mickey X if he's available? He's fucking right there. Um, we haven't heard issues of him in the past being a bad teammate. Uh, we know he can contribute. I, I assume Nuke Duck that he contributes pretty enormously to your macro and your comms. Is that fair to say? Uh, I'll be interested because uh, normally people say he's pretty quiet. I yeah I, I don't think he, he I mean I think he just understands it really well and then most uh, likely it's like more Mark and me more talking I would say and uh, but everyone talks but he he's a bit more quiet but he's also like I mean he understands it really well so he doesn't have to you know I mean yeah I, I think he just knows what what he has to do uh, like so he just like does it and plays very well but he also gives his opinions you know. If, if he thinks that we are doing something wrong. 
I mean, he, he obviously is a, if people don't realise, he obviously is a very decisive player. I mean, just think about when he joined the team. Like, my joke was that fucking Leona catch he had against, like, Fnatic when he joined your team. Like, he just justified his whole salary right then. Just got a fucking perfect engage off that beat the best team in the league in theory. Like, what what would you say the strengths of Mickey X are? Um, I think his, his strength definitely engaging. Yeah, like he knows when to go, and he's really not scared to die. And I really enjoy that uh, in especially my support uh, now in season twelve that he's not scared to die. Uh, so I would say he he plays very well mechanically, and he also plays like every champion. So uh, drafting becomes like uh, better. Uh, so, but I would say yeah, most of that like I think he plays just extremely well. But I also yeah. think he knows uh, well every other role kind of what they have to do and how their champions work so he can very well include himself in the game um because he knows uh, already uh all like how how all of the other lanes work so he can easily yeah he, he can just impact without uh, having to have too much communication to get it started he just knows kind of what he needs to do to be fair as well, like if you appreciate that a support who's not afraid to die, you know, when do you love to play with Mithy in Origin? That guy died more times than fucking Tom Cruise in Edge of Tomorrow. Whatever. Just <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. That's, that's just a straight shot. There's no <laughs> extra part about Mithy. You just do that for no reason. Love you. Still love you, mate. <laughs> I actually do think, though, by the way, I was joking about the Fnatic thing. Obviously, it was just a one off game. And I, by the way, Fnatic played that dragon fight fucking terribly. But I will say, like, I actually think that's a mad underrated quality, by the way. Everyone loves it in Hillasang, but somehow Mickey X never gets that credit. Like, having a really good support who can engage at a world class level is fucking so valuable in League of Legends. There's so many teams don't have that right now. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it makes it so you. The, first of all, the enemy has to be, you know, worried the whole game. Uh, they have to play scared, and you can always come back and you can end the game easier. And also, from like when you play a carry perspective, it's way easier to play if your team like finds the engage first, because then, you know, they they can't engage on you, so you can just deal damage, right? So it's um, yeah, I, I think it's super important too. Right, Monty, we, here's the thing. With NukeDuck, we can actually do a lot of meta-related stuff if you want. If you don't know, I'll give you the little explanation. No one else does this. They just do this bullshit where, like, you know, you stack narratives. My narratives change, NukeDuck. It goes like this. The first, yeah. let's say, three to four years of NukeDuck's career, he actually was a really good elite mid laner who just went like like a true mid laner. You just go there with the best champions in the game. You go head-to-head -head with the best players because we know all the best players are in the mid lane, thanks to Riot Games. And basically, if you're the better a mid laner you win you win the game but then a few years ago he actually learned monty that the game isn't always about just being the biggest the strongest the fastest so what he started doing which i appreciate is looking for every fucking slimy pick angle you could ever have in your champion pool so this <laughs> motherfucker he plays all the ridiculous vegar matchups the fucking he, he'll try and force sona into an lec game and, oh i love it mate on the one hand it's, <laughs> it's, when it doesn't work it looks terrible but when it works yeah. it looks like the shit it's the fucking it, there's a lot of people like a lot of people right now are p pretty boring picks like there's obviously all the logical shit Storyana and Corky all the time whatever what do you think Luke Doug? where's the meta at the moment seems like you're having fun with it um, yeah I am fun with it I um I mean when you say the meta I, I mean the meta is a bit more stale right than last year because you can't teleport on on oh you can or rather you can only teleport on the tower in the first 14 yes. minutes so the far meta is pretty strong i would say I like to play farming mid i i i think it's maybe even a bit too good so i think right now you but you, but you can also roam so like people i mean i think the meta is most of people are playing like when i try to play something weird it's a more like counter meta where like i'll play for example against rogue and i know they will first pick corky 100 percent so i can already we can already we can already prep during the week you know and uh uh, we can like play that draft many times, and they will obviously never have played against it. So then, um, we kind of want to, you know, get the surprise. But I will say that Larson also played very well with Corky. Uh, I guess I think he adapted really well. So uh, I mean, so they, they just destroyed us. I mean, I think it's it, it a lot of the the teleport meta. It's it's really profound, and and we've talked about this on previous shows how much it's affected the the champion pools that are are coming up. And one aspect that we've discussed previously has been that because you can't 
teleport before 14 minutes behind people in lane anymore, that it's caused a lot more bully and pushing lanes to develop. I mean, we've seen a lot more Caitlyn, we've seen a lot more Jinx. And one of the reasons why these champions are so powerful throughout the game is because they offer area denial. And, you know, Jinx traps and Caitlyn traps are very difficult to play around uh, on objectives. And now we're just seeing Vagar. <laughs> You know, one of the yeah. nice things about Vagar is he offers the same kind of choke denial, AOE cr crowd control that's, you know, buys you enough time frequently to to take a major objective on the map. Um, and you can run him with Predator. So he also has the ability to roam very quickly into side lanes and to, and to put pressure on front lines and objectives. So, uh, you know, I, I think this is just people figuring out over time within this game how important area denial is because you don't need you know in a in a game that you can take objectives for the most part very fast uh and also in a game that increasingly has lower and lower time to kill you know one instance of cc can turn a game on its head uh the chain cc will come in or frankly it's you know getting hit by a vagar cage is often just enough time to one shot somebody. You would think in the era where everything's played through fucking dragon fights, Vagar would have been viable way earlier. As you say, it's mega OP if you think about it. I, I think it has been strong for a bit, but I think it just took a while for pro players. I mean, you, it can take time for pro players to pick up on it, but he had some buffs recently. Do you think those really affected his play rate, Nuke Duck? Um, yes, they affected him, uh, but only in the way that it like put him in people's mind because it, the the, the buff is the buff is kind of fake, you know. Like you just get like one extra AP or something for a cannon minion, like so. Maybe you're gonna have like twenty more AP at twenty minutes or something. So, and they buff mostly fake, and uh, like people just you know try to try him out because of the buff, and then they realize like okay, he's pretty good. Like, right, listen actually, to the champions he's played this split, mate. Right? He has played Malzahar, fucking Zeri. Yeah, that's real. He played mid, mid. He played Vex. He's played three games of Vega. It's like, holy fuck. He played a game of Lissandra for fuck's sake. Uh, by the way, voluntarily. He wasn't even forced to play that. Like, holy fuck. You, you would just have a totally different conception of mid lane than everyone else right now, Nuke Duck. What's going on, mate? What is, Nuke, uh, what is mid lane right now for you? Uh, I mean, it's uh, the fact. I, I think I'm not the best Vex, uh, so like that game wasn't that good. But fair enough. Okay. Uh, um, I would say that I thought that Seri was really strong. Uh, so it, for me, it was like yeah, she was good enough to be played mid lane. Laning phase was like acceptable, I thought. And like later on, she's like completely broken. So when they picked her against Vitality, like actually, I wanted to play her regardless of them picking like, oh, okay. way or not, you know. Uh, but of course, when they pick Wayne, then it becomes even better. Um, and no, I I think I have some uh, counter picks and stuff that I think can work. And um, I think just that people have you know their own preference on on the counter pick. So when they picked LeBlanc, I I prefer to to pick Lissandra um, or or Malzahar. Um, uh, and some other people, some other stuff. But I I, I mean I just. But I know those counter pick work, so they just work for me, yeah. Do you think that a lot of this area denial is just too strong right now? Like when we talk about Caitlyn or Jinx or Malza, or I'm uh, sorry, Vagar or some of these other champions that can just clog up choke points so effectively within the game? Because to me, it just seems extremely oppressive. And also, if you get ahead with these champions, the snowball is just very difficult to stop because you can constantly set up early on objectives and then kind of just easily take them or find timing windows to just lay down the area denial and take the objective. Mm, I do think zone control is too OP, yes, but I, I, I don't think it's their traps, actually. It's their auto attack that is too <laughs> far. So I, I, that, I think that that's actually the main, like... Uh, that's fair. But it does the same thing. It, it's just um, that late game, the ADC does a lot of damage, and if you attack from too far away, then... You have to come to them, and then yeah, the traps come into play because you have to like so. It's kind of a two two sided thing because the enemy has to engage, but you also have traps. So then it becomes very hard uh, to face it. So especially if you play anything that wanna use hourglass, um, 
it's if you use it you will he will just put a trap on you either jinx or caitlin and you are you are like then you'll get chains to seed so yeah or, they, if they come a, or if you get hit by a vagar cage you just get trapped yeah. uh yeah uh, yeah, or yeah, you can't walk into Vagar Cage in late game. You will like it doesn't even matter if you are a tank. Like you'll most likely die. So yeah, I, I think like long range and uh, and CC. Yeah, I think it's a little bit too good there. Right. If since there's obviously loads we can talk about in LEC, right? One team I noticed that no one talks about as a team, but they have inexplicably done way better in the LEC than people expect is Misfits. Because the problem is in the off season they didn't have the sexiest off season. Like they obviously lost people like Razork, who looked like one of the best junglers in the league. They they didn't really make like big name signings. They just kept the same team, but a slightly worse version of it. But I have to say, you just played them this week, so I want to get your take on this. Right, mate. I'm I'm just a pleb. Obviously, I'd not consider myself an expert, but I think Vethio is the fucking truth, mate. He he genuinely looks like the next fucking Caps type player. He just looks so looks super fucking good. Am I am I overrating him, Nuke Doc? What do you think? Um, no, I think he's really good. Um, he um, uh, but he doesn't have like Caps effect. Um, like Caps just uh, he he was different. Uh, okay, like even when he came in as a rookie, you know, uh, the first split, even when people, you know, outside it didn't. People didn't rate him so highly because he yes. had a lot of depths and they lose some games. He got caught sometimes in late game. But you already knew uh, from playing against him uh, in mid lane that he had something special. Uh, but uh, so I, I wouldn't say Vettu is exactly like that, but he does play really well like every single game. Like he doesn't ha ever have an off game. And uh, he also pretty much carried uh, against Mad Lions when they were. Uh, they were completely destroyed bot lane and top lane, and he still carried with Corky, so I thought that was very impressive. And uh, and I mean, if you add out together all the games, he's probably the best performing mid laner so far. He'll be the MVP so, of the league, right? He'll be, yeah, yeah. be legit. I think it'll be fair. Yeah, As you say, for yeah. me, you carried the fuck out of that Misfits team, mate. If you had like a normal mid laner in their spot, I don't even know if they'd be a playoff team. Like That team just looks average. Um... Yeah, I, I don't think the other players are like that that bad, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, he he does. I, I think. I, I mean, yeah, I think he 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 helped their wins a lot just because of how well he played every single game. So, uh, in the end, they had a huge impact on their uh, record, probably. Yeah, but but I will say that the other players are also pretty pretty good. I think. Yeah, they're not. They're not. They were they, listen. Heavy was pretty, pretty good hard. last year. Last year he was. He's been fucking atrocious in some games. This split, mate. He, I he's mean, I think he fucking nightmare games. He also did very well in the game they played against XL, and I think that he caused a lot of giant fucking issues for you guys in the game that you played. Uh, you got a giant fucking issue in the same Finn. lane, mate. What do you expect? Just saying. Listen, boys, I'm on a different tack. <laughs> I'm on a different tack from all you guys. If I'm in one of the worst teams, then yeah, I want players that like, they're all right. No, they're, not, they're not the main problem we lose. I want good players, cocksucker. You can take all the women who are just like, oh, they're just all right. Like, I'll have all the bad bitches with fucking straight fire ass. How about that? Like, I want fucking good players. I don't just want some okay players. Like, well, he's not the worst player. I'm, not, I'm trying to get the best player, not fucking not the worst. Oh, it's a scouting technique. What the fuck is this? I'm trying to be like whoever it is at XL that said she got a set of nuts and they were like, oh, Advian, nice guy. Yeah, go home to your family. Bring Mickey X in, the fucking champion. Do, 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 do. NWO, <laughs> new, new, new world order. Exactly. That's what I'm on. I'm on that shit. So shout out Young Buck, whoever did that fucking move, whoever did that move in XL. One of the few good moves they made aside from being in a nuke duck. <laughs> they opinion. have Nelson now as well. People, That's true. They people do forget about that. They do have uh, Nelson. They, how, Actually, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, what's the impact of Nelson mean? Because no one really knows outside. Remember what coaches do. Like they don't know. Is he like a fucking wizard? Does he tell you all the stuff from the LPL? What does he do? What's what does Nelson do, mate? Uh, yeah, he 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 tells what he like his experience from LPL, and I would say he's like very gameplay related. So it helps uh, out. He knows. Uh, yeah, he just knows what everyone should be doing, and and he has kind of what I would like to call like a full game knowledge, where okay. you all we know like uh, not not that many coaches have this, I think, and that's where he knows like kind of the macro play, but he also knows like how the champions interact with each other oh, okay. in like uh, in like um you know in like specific uh, interactions or whatever. Yeah, yeah, mm, exactly, and and that and and if you want to play really well, uh, you those small things. Uh, affect how you want to play the big picture as well, uh, and I think he he knows both, and that way he 
he can teach us uh, like better, you know, like he can be more specific and uh, tell us like where we fucked up. He can spot it fast. And uh, so I think that's... uh, Because I heard from even some really good Western players that they would try to argue like you do with any coach. Like, no, but I think this champion's good or whatever. And then he would basically just tell them like, yeah, it's good for that guy in the LPL. You aren't that guy. Like, you're not picking it. Like, I've heard (laughs) heard he gets like a spicy side to him. Does he? Yeah, I mean, he's a bit spicy. So, um, you know, Sometimes when we play scrims, and he he sits behind us uh, in the in the player room and is not watching on the stream, and he, he will just like if we make a misplay, sometimes start laughing at us uh, or something like that. You know, like if we make a bad play, he will like either be like oh, like right behind in your ear, or he will you know just start laughing. Uh, so he he can be a bit spicy, you know. Keeps the mood light, you know. <laughs> yeah. Do you, as long I, as you. Does he? Does that tilt some people sometimes? Do you? Do you feel it? Does it frustrate you? Uh, no, it doesn't frustrate me. But definitely, I, I mean, it haven't happened yet. But I can definitely see if someone is like pretty tilted, <laughs> then it could push them over the edge. Definitely. <laughs> um, but uh, we, but our team, we don't really tilt uh, when we play. We, everyone is. I don't know. Everyone's so chill, and we are like friends, so nobody like blames each other or tilt or something like that. So. I think part of what what goes underappreciated about Nelson in general is that it, not only his own abilities, obviously as a coach, but just the fact that he's like c- hooked up with that uh, the the Taiwanese coach mafia that coaches like yeah. all of the best teams in the world because we know they all talk to each other and they all share information and the fact that he's part of that network is just enormously helpful because he uh, he's constantly i know bouncing ideas off those guys and chatting with them about what's going on in the different regions and they they kind of all these all these coaches have kind of created a shared pool of knowledge um which is fascinating uh and it's such a unique advantage that most other coaches are not going to be able to share, especially in the West. The only thing is, though, imagine what a bad mismatch it was that G2 hired him, though, for that specific year, Monty. They hired an LPL coach and gave him an AD carry who doesn't like to ever go in or die. I bet he was just going... <laughs> but he doesn't <laughs> like to go... This is, I've never had this problem. A bit like the, it was just tearing his mind apart. He probably thought he was an alternate reality or something there. We'll, we'll have Nelson on. I, I've, had, I've had a conversation with Nelson about what he thinks about reckless but it's weird. i'll let him express it's, himself it's good news <laughs> unlike a lot of the other pussies he could actually give us the fucking real good good shit on all those teams he was in so whatever <laughs> until we'll he's been in excel we can find out what was really going on in excel <laughs> no, whatever anyway what about this so i've got a question for you here nuke doc which is mm. on paper we're all supposed to believe that rogue really is the best team the problem is mate we we'll all get sick of getting tricked by Rogue, where they always just wreck everyone in the playoffs. Don't they? Like they just fall apart completely, and they've never been as good. Do you act, is Rogue the best team right now? Would you put your weight behind them as the best? Um, I think they are the best team now, but I don't think they will win the split. But I, but I do think they are the best team right now. Yeah. What have they nailed at the moment? Um, I, I, it's hard to say, but but they all play pretty well. I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean. I feel like everyone plays so similarly that it's like hard for me to say exactly what, but I would say uh, the team really knows how to play, and I think Larsen knows exactly you know what he needs to do, and uh, also Malrang is also very like I feel like he plays he's very good at like being in the moment kind of like he he he's he, so he will random. see it's yeah, so yeah, crazy. He, yeah, he won't let like inters go unpunished at all, you know. Like he he doesn't think like he has that ability where if he sees that you know a lane is overextended and he thinks based on the enemy jungle path that he's probably not there, he's gonna go for it, uh, you know, every time. So, so I think he he definitely adds like some kind of you know X factor to Rogue, and then on top of that they all play really well. So. Uh, you if you, want to, oh, if if you... No, if you guys want a more concrete example of this, go back and watch the uh, the Rogue um, Mad Lions game uh, from this from Friday, because if you watch like if you watch Malrong's pathing, hold on, let me pull it up, because <laughs> it's it's honestly just fucking hilarious because he's there on blue side and he starts blue as Hecarim and he knows El Yoya is starting at his red on Lee Sin. And what he does is he takes the blue side jungle and then just immediately runs bot and then just bypasses all the wards knowing he's going to be three buffed and then just straight 
ghost eases Hecarim into this lane and, and picks up first blood. Um, and it's just, it's just shit like that, where he has such a sense of where the vision can be and what the enemy jungler is doing. And the fact that LLU just showed in mid walking red to red, um, that he's just, he'll, he'll make these plays immediately. And I think a lot of other junglers, you know, they might try, uh, you know, they might try and just farm it out or take a recall. And this guy will just immediately pull the trigger on the gank, even if it's going to cost him farm. And that's why he's frequently, you know, 10 15 cs down uh in the early game but it comes with a lot of kills a lot of the time and the way the jungle works right now is you can be 10 to 15 cs down but you often won't be a level down and that's what really matters especially because of the gold value of levels in the early game i think the average like gold value of a level in the early game is around 500 gold so early it, it you know as long as you're not down levels you can actually catch back up somewhat effectively uh, in the jungle. And he'll just make these like very weird cross map ganks. He'll, he'll, he, he, I think he gets the gank off bottom and then he paths to enemy Krugs. Like there's just fucking weird shit that he does. Um, that is, is really, I think hard to read as, as an opponent. Do you, do you find it difficult to know where Malrong is on the map at times? Because he, he's, he's so inefficient at times that it's kind of mind boggling. Um, yeah, I, I, for, for me, I, I find it not that, it's not that surprising to me anymore, uh, because if uh, Larson plays something that they want to gank mid with, uh, that's kind of rare, uh, so usually Malarong will gank the silence, but if they do, like, I know that the guy's always gonna come and gank, so it's like, it's not that unpredictable, but, uh, yeah, I, no, I, I think it's definitely the most unpredictable, but at the same time, the nature of the jungle right now is very predictable. Um, so, and um, you can't really do a creative uh, gameplay unless you get kills, because it will cause you to be behind, and then the enemy almost automatically takes Herald from that. So, you when you do want to be creative in the jungle you kind of have to you need to get some payoff uh, he can't just like uh, not play like a normal jungle all the time you know it's just got to be like one moment or or one gank kind of yeah but after he needs to he still needs to play like you know the normally how, how we expect him to i had an interesting sidebar i thought we could do on this one because i thought i would get your take on this as like a meta context of coaching because to me rogue as an org have to be the best example of the different types of skill sets that there are in coaching because think about this right monty if you go to the summer of 2020 onwards we're now four splits in a row right they had the summer one of 2020 both splits in 2021 and we've got this split now right so essentially in all four of these splits thus far Rogue has been the best regular season team. They've won the most games. No one wins more. Four splits in a row. And they, that isn't, by the way, the same team. Like The first team had Finn and fucking, um, what's it, Vander in it. And then last year, obviously, they got Odoam there and Trimby in. And then this year, they've got, instead of Inspired, they've got Malrang. And they've got in, obviously, fucking Comp as the... So they've changed the team. They've changed three different sets of teams. They've even dominated in different ways. Like the summer one in 2020, if you remember, was like, we just win by scaling. We just make it so that because we scale in the game, but we can't lose. Last year was where it was like, we have to just win lane as hard as possible without any jungle interaction so that then we're OP as fuck in the mid game and we got to just win automatically. And then this year, they're like, the gank everything all the time all over the map. Like, th these are totally radical. So what this says to me is this. They cannot be the case by the way that the role coaching staff suck actually yes. it's the opposite but this is what i'm interested to, to get your thoughts on as a sidebar is it shows how different winning regular season games against many different opponents is from being in a playoff setting and adapting it over a series is a different skill set right I, I yeah i mean that's the problem with best of ones generally in the west is that what you're training for for the regular season is not the same test that you're taking uh when you actually deal with the playoffs when you need to be nimble but you know i honestly don't think it was even the the adaptation over series it was frankly just fucking throwing uh you know that cost rogue titles like in in this game five versus mad lions where they just epically threw in the fifth game despite having what should have been a guaranteed victory within that game if they played it out in a sane fashion. So I think a lot of it is mentality and, and choking uh, more than anything else, which obviously there are specific coaches for that. And I don't know what Rogue has in terms of uh, kind of performance coaches, because to me, that's the missing piece. And we've talked about this on the show, but it is 
it is absolutely insane that Rogue could have so drastically switched their entire jungler. Totally. Style. They literally 180'd their jungle style yep. from farm pathing jungler, like pathing Nirvana, ultimate optimization. We're all playing around Inspire. It's how EG plays now. You have to play that way around Inspire. He's a very good jungler. But then to go with the ultimate, I would say, selfless jungler in Malrong, whose entire purpose is to hamstring himself to get his lanes ahead, to then pivot and then continue the level of success with many of the same players is shocking. I mean, it's, it's frankly like super shocking. That's I can't remember cool. another team yeah. in esports that's done that absolutely. so effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, what about this, Nuke Dog? So we can bring you back in. I want to ask you this, right? What do you think of Humanoid, this split? Because obviously he's just won two championships. A lot of people thought he was like the shit in Mad Lions, blah, blah, blah. What do you think of where he's at as a mid laner? Um, I think he he has what it takes to be the best mid laner. Um, I think he probably will be the best mid in playoffs. And uh, I think, I have a feeling like he just kind of, you know, bored right now. He mails it in during the split and just sort of waits for playoffs to begin. It yeah, looks like that, doesn't maybe, it? Maybe, maybe. maybe. Was, I think there's taught, a good chance. He was taught, like, we know that this has been part of Mad Lions coaching philosophy. Like, Mac has said this. Pre Peter Dunn has said this when they were part of Mad Lions, is that they would sandbag, like, early in splits to give or mid split to give players a break in order to ramp up practice in time for playoffs. So humanoid has been part of the system as a pro player for a significant amount of time. And I, I frankly think that that's what he must be doing right now uh, because I think he's still strong, but he probably is not exerting the sum total of all of his energies and motivation at the current time. What do you think overall about Fnatic though, Nuke Dunk? Because obviously on paper, they look like they're the best roster, but something something's off, even though they're clearly still very good. Like, I think they could have lost at least two or three of the games they've won. Like, I think they've been a little bit underwhelming. Where, where do you think Fnatic as a team is at? Are the in scrims, are they actually the best? Are they good? No. They, they, are, they are not good in scrims uh, uh, so far, uh, I would say. And I think, uh, I... Yeah, I don't think they're that good right now, to be honest. I think, yeah, I, I I feel like they might have some problems or something because I think they usually only win if they like stomp bot lane and they can play around that. Uh, but otherwise, they I, I feel like they have a hard time winning right now. Um, but all of their players are really good, so you know that they could. I, I think probably they have something wrong about their team right now. Like uh, some, but I'm not sure they know what, like what or or what. But I think something is wrong, and uh, they need to find out what what's wrong. What do you think, Monty? What do you think of Fnatic? I mean, I think overall, uh, if we look at the entire course of the season, that Razork has been underwhelming compared to the performance that we've we were expecting to see from him considering he was in the conversation for top junglers in the league last sure. year. Um, I, I, I think some of their wins have, have come as a result of Hillisang kind of making some risky plays that worked out for them, which is in Hillisong's nature. Like he's going to win you some games as a player just because he, he does these things. It's, I, I think it's somewhat troubling, I would say, that some of their wins have come as a result of going back to specific kind of comfort picks uh, for this roster. Like we saw the win over G2 come with the classic Hillisang Pike, Humanoid on the TF. These are uh, signature Wonder on Camille. These are signature kind of pocket picks or champions that, you know, certainly some, many of these champions are in the meta, but these are have long been signature picks for these players. Um, I guess I was encouraged by their win over G2, which was remarkably clean. So maybe they just needed to return to some comfort in order to pick themselves back up again. But it just looks like it's not necessarily an individual play issue as much as it is a, an overall synergy issue with these Ross, this roster. But it's again, it's hard to complain considering they are in fact in second place in the league. So you, you, they have a cushion to, you know, lose a few games as they try and shift up their play style or establish new synergy um, in time for the playoffs. Like, they're, I think they're pretty much guaranteed to go to the playoffs at this point in time.
I mean, it's it's possible they couldn't, but yeah, they'd have to lose like a lot of games, basically. Here's my yeah. problem I have with Fnatic is this. They have a really weird thing I've never seen before, Monty, which is on the one hand, they've gone for like a super team in terms of the people they've brought on paper. Normally, the reason super teams fail is one, certain players just don't work well together, but then two, it makes the players way worse. What's weird is they've got number one, a bunch of players don't seem like they interact very well. Like like Razork doesn't seem like he interacts with certain lanes at all. Certain players just look like they're not even on the same team. But bizarrely, it's like the strength of the roster it really does just win them games dude like I actually don't even think there's a world where this team could come like fifth or something like they look like they're a lock to be a top three team no matter what look at what do you think what do you think's um, off because on paper I thought this was going to be the best roster mate it looked amazing in the off season yeah, I think it's the best roster too if you look at it um, yeah I thought so as well um, no I, I think they at the mo like of course I think they won the first five or six games uh, so they have a buffer of course and they will definitely make playoffs uh, but I do also think they could lose against a playoff team. But they, they like they could also win the whole thing. But I, it's very hard for me to to say because I like for example they lose losing against Astralis and yeah I I think it depends you know like because there is also a chance that they're you know trying out some new stuff for the playoffs. But if they are not, then I think they could very well end up sixth place or first place uh, I, I think it just depends on like how well they manage to play together like I think they're yeah or like how good is their meta read and how good is their team play and also if they manage to you know uh, just stomp lanes like uh, they have been doing I, I think it's also really I think humanoids individual play I think to me the biggest question marks like you might have thought coming in that like wonder would be kind of the biggest question mark but for me it's been Razark and and humanoid and humanoid you know it, they they really invest like an absolute fuck ton of resources into this guy uh like they're they're really like trying to get him ahead they're trying to feed him he's like number one in the entire LEC in terms of percentage of CS he gets after 15 minutes, but he's also the highest death mid laner by percentage by a significant margin at 27 and a half compared to caps 23, nine. So it's like, the problem is, is that he gets caught out at really bad times frequently, which then that was even a problem in mad lines though, right? You used to just get caught out randomly in that team as well. So it's, it's hard to know whether it's a communication issue about where he is or what he expects the team to do or what the team is telling him. Um, obviously those scenarios are very hard to diagnose if you don't have access to comms, but he, when you, when you have such an extreme amount of resources, like you are the funnel of the team. If you are also dying the most amount of times, that means when you die, a, a huge amount of your team's gold is basically just wiped off the map and it becomes really difficult to fight uh, after that because of the resource allocation. So for me, I think it's, it's really, it, it, that to me is like the number one issue I would say with, with humanoid right now is that I think he just needs to be more cognizant in the mid and late game about where he is and understand that he is he is the carry of this roster more or less um and that's how the team is playing and that's how the the team is allocating the resources and he, he simply just can't be in these positions so i think if they solve that issue that a lot of the a lot of the other issues with this roster will also you know come into play what about this then, Nuke Doc? The other team that, again, on paper looked awesome in the offseason was obviously Vitality, who tried to make their own super team, whatever that fucking term means anymore. It's like the most cursed team of all, term of all time now. But obviously on paper, they were supposed to be amazing. Now, they had the opposite scenario to what you said with Fnatic. Whereas Fnatic began amazingly, so they actually had a little cushion, because Vitality began by losing all the games in the first week. Actually, even when they've won loads of games since, they're still in like a precarious position. So where is Vitality at for you at the moment, Nuke Doc? Mm, I think they are okay. I think uh, their individual uh, like uh, kind of superior superiority to to over other teams is kind of overblown a little bit. I think um, so. And they they try to play around top, and they actually manage to win a game through top. Not not many EU teams can do that, by the way. Um, so that was impressive. Um, but I think they 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 are okay. I, I, they're of course really hit or miss. Um, I think there there's definitely a chance that they could not make playoffs. I think. Um, but... Just with the record there is, yeah, for sure. They've already uh, lost yeah. seven games. People don't know. Yeah. Um, so 
for me, I think they're okay. I I don't think they're gonna win. I I don't think they. I don't. I don't actually think they have. I just. I actually don't think that they, they're gonna win the split. I, I what don't do you think, think about where? Shot. What about you think about where Perks is at? Because it, listen, the last few weeks haven't been great. But if you went to the middle part of this, like if you went to like week two to four or whatever, he was looking awesome. It looked like he like re rediscovered his whole game. Uh yeah, I think Perks is very good. Uh, but I also think that uh, I think all the the top teams have pretty good mid laners. Uh, right. so like I think that the I I don't see like uh, him uh, getting like a huge advantage from that. Um, but I do think he plays he plays well. I mean, uh, of course, this this weekend he tried to play for the team. Like he tried to just roam and gank the gank the side lanes. And they managed to win one game like that, and they lost the other game. Uh, so I, I, for me, it's hard. I, I think he plays well, and uh, I think he's versatile. He can play multiple styles. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Just uh, it seems pretty pretty good. I think seems pretty good, but not not like uh, I don't see at the moment like being a huge advantage if when facing other top teams. I have, thing real, Monty, I I have like really we, strong opinions. Yeah, about my good, because right the thing is, I was going to say, we, this is a team, right? This is another team. I don't want to hear any of that jazz of like, well, it's no, it's all right. There's no all right. You made a team like this to win LEC and to go to Worlds. Like, a team like this has to have huge expectations, Monty. So give me your thoughts on this one. There's got to be some problems with this squad. I think this team is pathetic uh, for for what the caliber of this roster is. I think that their early game is tragic. Um the, it looks I, like I have no idea what is going on with their communication, but they're not even really it's it feels like they're not even communicating basic things to each other um, because they get cross mapped super easily by other teams. I mean, we can talk about the game you guys played against them uh, last week because I rewatched that that game before before the show today, Nuke Duck and like. You guys picked them apart when they had a huge early game advantage because they just did stupid shit on the map for the first twenty minutes of the game. It's yeah, like I, they, I they think th that game. Well, just to, to, I think yeah, that game. Uh, I have no idea what they were doing. Like we, we were we were like ready to lose, you know. Uh, we were so behind and uh, the I didn't even, like I, I don't know what they did to be honest. So yeah, yeah. There's yeah, way. I mean, that. they they had a huge advantage in the bot lane early that they completely threw away through what felt like random plays that you just cross mapped them on, and then you were you managed to get uh you managed to get uh your affiliates like back into the game very effectively. So Patrick, who is really really struggling uh in the early game, they just it it feels like they don't know how to choke people out in the early game and where they've been winning games is because they can team fight. Okay. In the late game. And they've, they've picked compositions that allow them to scale. And sometimes they're able to kind of clutch it out, but it's, it's also the way it's every aspect of the way they're playing the early game. Honestly, like sometimes I watch games where there'll be a huge stacked wave coming into top lane and Alfari sitting there under turret and self -made just isn't there. So Alfari just gets dove for free. They're, they're not communicating wave states. It feels like, um, they are unwilling to, snowball their advantages like when when they got that lead against you guys Carzi and lebrov were just like going random places on the map for no reason it felt like like they just abandoned the lane and then they were swapping their solo laners between mid and uh and top lane based on re like what felt like very weird recall timings um that was the game where lebrov was playing leona right i'm trying to remember yes it yeah. So uh, it, even things like even things like uh, I, I'm trying to remember if this was the exact game uh, because they would like there were times where you guys were setting up a play in bot lane, I think, and they would both recall in the jungle and then Lebrov would just randomly cancel his recall and then they would both like both him and Karzi would die under turret or whatever, or both him and Alfari would die under the turret. And self maybe going back to base and it just feels like they're the communicate there's been a total communication breakdown between where to be on the map and at what time and it it feels random and arbitrary much of the time how is it to play against this team because they just seem to perpetually make the the wrong move or to not be communicating critical information to each other i i my suspicion is that this that they panicked this game because of their matchups um 
because uh, like a while, of course, Wayne has the lead against. She's playing against Aphelios, uh, looks, and she does not have cleanse. Uh, so that means whenever Aphelios have the snare again, she will die. Um, so uh, because uh, that's because we flex Seri mid, but Seri was my most played champion in Solarky on my main account, so they should have probably seen it coming. But uh, I I think they panicked uh, by the, their lane matchups um, and decided to try to kind of make something up on the go like uh, Wayne uh, goes mid with Thresh and Rice goes against Malphite and uh, they try yeah. to play Jace on weak side and protect him and they kind of just like uh, cooked it up on the fly I think because they were so worried about their bot lane matchup and they might have also been worried about top matchup because you know uh, while no, they were ganking I... also yeah because we ganked uh, we ganked uh, top early and, and we killed him and he used flash uh, while they were you know ganking us bot and mid so probably they were they probably were scared that Jace was gonna probably lose to Malphite pretty hard, and that uh, their bot lane would lose hard. And then they like they they probably just kind of panicked, even though they they were pretty ahead. And I think they could uh, win that game easier if Rice just stayed mid, because I was completely out of this game because lane was frozen mid, and I was and I could not walk up to it for like three minutes or or, or like two minutes, I don't know. And I ended up even dying once. Uh, because uh, yeah, because the the top laner also roamed. Uh, so I think if they would have played normal, uh, Rice could have had maybe 40 CS lead mid uh, against me at 10 minutes, and he could try to you know salvage the side lanes from with his prio and roam with the jungler. I think it would have been a better idea. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I think they just got got a bit uh, dizzy from like the matchups. They probably thought it was like a really bad situation, and they just wanted to try something else. Yeah, it's it is a just... great concept that the LEC should bring in. You know that famous advert style, Monty, the, the Maybelline one back in the day, where they would have some like 90s boomer actress and they'd go, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. It's Spoiler, it was always just computer graphics. It was always just computer graphics. <laughs> but okay, but sadly, I mean, the joke would be, it's shame you can't concrete graphics your face, but in the future, like, that will happen. Like when everyone walks around with these fucked up dystopian, like fucking metaverse implants, you'll just have a permanent filter on your wife so she'll just look twice as good looking, won't she? So you'll be able to cope with the, the life cycle. But anyway, what they should do is a version like that. It's a feature for LEC. And the question is, is it OP or is it OPGG? There's the partnership you need to do. Because the question is, was the champion itself actually OP or did Nuke Duck just play 30 games of it? That's basically what you need to know with any sort of single pixel. I think that's a straight fire partnership. Hit me up if you want to get that, get that one going, you know. Yeah, I, I'm just like fast forwarding through this game now, Nuke Duck. And this is like, they're like in, in your topside jungle, like, Karzi and Lebrov just farming at like six minutes into the game. And you would think like these lane swaps would have resulted in win Herald spawns, like sure. them getting Herald. But it, you basically, your team basically just gets free kills on Alfari because there's no objective for them to take on the top side of the map when they have control. And then you guys just then get the kills and then rotate top and then just shit on them at the herald take the herald and then snowball a gold lead i like it maybe i maybe you're right i think it i mean it, your your supposition about what was going on with the lane makes sense but also their actions make no sense in this game uh, at all but 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 in that situation what they're thinking is that uh, jason thunder will not die two versus three bot lane like that's what they're yeah. I, i'm i'm fully sure that that's what they're think and i think there is almost no other champion than aphelios that can like uh, kill them there because they're top laner and jungler under a turret and they're getting died by our support jungle and ADC straight yep. up double killed in a dive cleanly. Yep. So I think they also did not expect this situation to happen and I I think there is also I think just uh, like the, Mark, Mickey and Patrick play that really well. Um, yeah, sure. I, I think a lot of I don't think a lot of like support uh, AD jungle uh, like a trio would have actually dived them there and killed them both. I think very few, like, yeah, I think it was an irregular play for them. I think they all saw it coming, and I think it was very, I think it was actually completely insane that they recognized that they can make that play. I think it was really good. And that, that broke everything for them, of course, because yeah. they could have had Thresh bot lane, you know, uh, but they just they just didn't because they, they didn't see this as a threat, uh, probably. Well, credit credit to your coaches, I guess, then, and for you guys for pulling out this draft and for knowing your limits. But, you know, at the same time, like these are 
this is a vitality roster that's composed of extremely veteran players that I would think should know these things, right? Isn't that a fair expectation of them? Sure. What about this then? Right, listen, fuck Vitality. They've done what they've done. We talked about them. The other team we need to talk about is this one. It's not not unsurprisingly Mad Lions, because guess what? Mad Lions isn't that good. It's G2, obviously. Right, G2's just obviously had the week where they looked a bit silly because went 0-2. And they lost to SK Gaming. Oh, I will say, SK Gaming is going to probably st- continue to steal the odd win off teams when everyone thinks they're trash, because who the fuck knows why it's SK Gaming, isn't it, right? Where's G2 at, though, Nuke Duck? Because this is a team where they took a big gamble, obviously, with signing Flak as the AD cap. Like people know the story, maybe they could have had Hans Sama or Kazi or these big name players, etc. Right at the moment, I have to say, I find this G2 squad a bit underwhelming. Like, on the one hand, I do think Targamas looks really good, I can see where they signed him. Broken Blade looks fine, but like, it's been the story on every show, but it's true. Caps just doesn't look anything like Caps, mate. It just looks like a good player. Like, it's not, when you were saying earlier, the Caps effect, like the Caps effect doesn't say pay to exist, he's just, he's just a player now. He's, you know, there's no terror when you play against this guy. Am I wrong? Like, isn't he what the whole team's supposed to be based around, mate? Um, I think that, for example, in their loss, uh, he couldn't... Wait, what? I can't... So, and he lost one game against Fnatic, right? They lost mm-hmm. to SK uh, Fnatic, yes. They got stomped by Fnatic. It was, oh, the, yeah, Pike, yeah. It was so, the Pike so, game that Hillsong popped off on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that one I can remember clearly, but now I can remember the SK game too because uh, I just didn't think about it. So, I think Cups is very good, and I think... Uh, right now in scrims, I do think G2 is the best team in Europe. Okay. And um, I think uh, in this meta on mid lane, I don't think you can do that much. Uh, like, as I said, it's the farming meta. He plays Victor. He plays against Oriana. Like, he completely fists Oriana on lane. Like, uh, it, uh, he destroyed mid lane against SK, but uh, they lost late game. And you can't really make that much outplay with Victor. Like, of course, you can do damage, you can dodge skill shots. Um, but uh, you can't dodge strings out to attack. Yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, you can't really risk to dodge Oriana ball as well in later part of the games because if you get hit by ult, you, you lose the whole game. So I think Cups is actually playing really well. And uh, they just had kind of uh, some situations that made them lose the, the games. Um, and for me, G2 in playoffs would be the scariest team to face, I think, for me. Because uh, I think Cups is really, really good now. And I also think their bot lane is good. I, I, of course, their bot lane is not uh, as good as the best bot lanes in terms of laning. Uh, but Taragamas is like active, plays a lot of champs, and uh, they're they're not scared to to sacrifice their ADC a little bit. But he also he also plays really solid when when they pick him Jinx, and he's supposed to carry. Um, so my verdict would be that right now I think G2 is the most scary, and I think. So they're actually the different. sleeper best team for you, even though they just went 0-2. They're actually secretly the best team in LXC. What, what, what I love about yes. this, Soren, is that okay. Caps has basically turned into Nuke Duck this year. So, of course, Nuke Duck fucking thinks Caps is good. He's just he's another Cal- version how, of Nuke Duck. How, how, yeah. how, 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 how is that? <laughs> he, he's become a very low economy mid laner. Like, he's, he's playing objectively a, a lower economy role than he has in the past, in spite of the fact that he's still playing many carry champions. It's not like he's playing more support. I think he's played, like, one game of... TF and even then TF often has a higher economy because of the passive. But I think for the most part, this is the most selfless version of caps that I've seen. Um, it's just it's just a difference in play style. He doesn't have the same kind of aggressive edge. Oh, just look at his champion pool. He's played two games of Oriana, three games of Victor, and three games of Rise. Like, who the fuck is this? Is this Caps? Like, <laughs> what are we talking about? Who, where, where are all the Vethio champions? Where's his fucking Yasuo game? What, what is this? Am I tuning in the wrong year? How, wait, come on. Nuke Doc, you were there during the Primer Caps, like Season 8 Caps, where you were going head-to-head with him when you are on Shocker. You think he looks comparable to that player now? Right, what, where, yes. where are we going on this one? Okay. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think, but... Uh... So he also has another very good uh, attribute is that he doesn't pick Yasuo because it's really bad actually, but it like works sometimes. <laughs> okay. but it's actually, here's here's a funny so, thing. Yeah, here's yeah, a funny sorry, new I think Yasuo has a hundred percent win rate in LEC right now. Probably does. I'm gonna check. I'm gonna check. <laughs> hasn't been played many times. I'm sure he played like three times. Yeah, it's also I, I, only I, been only been played with Diana, I think. But anyway. Yeah, but... yeah. Of course, you play with Diana, but it's just like uh, you know. Anyway, I think it helps, I, I think he's smart when it comes to drafting and. If anything, uh, if they were to when they play more round caps, they probably do lose. better as well. No, no, they don't. They'll be uh, even better, right? I say, okay. Yeah, oh, they will. They will win probably. Uh, so, 
I don't like. Of course, uh, you know you can int sometimes, but when you play because it's different when I watch one game. Yeah, but yeah. In the scrim, and but in the scrim, I play like five games in a row. You know, so it's easier to like yes, see like yes, of the average of like how good they are, not just because you know they got ganked once, they died, and behind, and now yeah. they will look like a bit weak the whole game. Um, so I don't know. Team team looks strong. I think uh, they could definitely lose uh, if their bot lane loses lane too hard. Um, or if Broken Blaze do goes too crazy with his picks, they could definitely lose. Um, but I think overall they they are the they are the scariest team now. Also, but also because it looks like Fnatic have some kind of problem. But they are will also of course be very scary if they if they are at full strength. Fair enough. All right, it's it's three and one so far, or four and one. Mm-hmm. After I look it up, so it has lost a game. Uh, but yeah. for the most part, and again, it has been kind of situational picked with the uh, with the Diana as a combo. But and it's been most, it's been mostly every, played by Vitality as well. Probably every time with Diana, I would imagine. Yeah, so four four and one so far, but obviously still a still a niche pick. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, I, I think like what's what's interesting to me is that it just feels like Caps is is being more of a team player than he ever has been. And I think it's not that he's been bad at that job. And obviously G2, I think has been kind of, people will look at the game this last week where they got stomped by Fnatic and probably overread into that game. Uh, But for the most part, I think it's just a shift up in his style and the way that he wants to play the game at this point in his career. Which is fine. Tell me, tell me this then, Nuke Doc. So you alluded earlier to the idea that maybe Vethiol's the best mid laner. You said like you might be the best mid laner this split. Right, if right. Vethiol's... So, yeah, go on. So, so, I'll, I'll, so if you add together all the performances of this uh, split, Vethiol was probably the best. Okay, so uh, he's number one. Who's, num- is, who's number two then? Is it Caps? Uh, I mean, that I'm not sure about, but I like... The, the question no, is, would it be... No, 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 no. Go on. No, Go it's on. Larson then. It's Larson then. You know, right. if you think about, okay. like, who right. uh, who did the best uh, throughout the split. Uh, but uh, Larson's very... I've talked about him, but he... Um, yeah. But I'm just... Uh, I'm just saying about, you know, kind of how good I think they can be, you know, because... I mean... Yeah, I like I, I, if you were to like give an MVP award from the split for mid laner, it would be Vettio or Larson. It probably depends on the last okay. uh, last yeah, uh, five games, right? Uh, but uh, for playoff scenario, that I think like Cups uh, might be the strongest. Okay, uh, yeah, that's a good way to frame it. I think. Yeah, I'll also say as well. One area I noticed that players and coaches are very different from fans is fans only only go on the official LEC games. That's what they rate you off. So as a result, yeah, if you go on off that, like they're never gonna have caps as the best mid laner. But I've noticed most of the players and coaches go more with like who they think overall every factor combined is like a better player. So I'll give you an example. I know in past years when other people were thinking like Yankos wasn't that good. I know that like Yamato, for example, used to always just have Yankos number one because his logic was well when we get to playoffs and we get to worlds he'll just be the best so there's it i know players have different ways of rating people and I, as you say you've seen the scrims we haven't so fair play i don't hate it it certainly made me more interested to see what'll happen in the playoffs if they just creep in as like the fourth or the fifth seed or something i'll be very interested to see what happens in that first round matchup that's for sure yeah, yeah i, I think question. it will be exciting yeah here's my question though is this we didn't really ask about this earlier because we just did the ross move on. this is my question right what is the what should the expectation for xl be though nuke dog where should we expect XL to be? What's your I sense? Think it's, I it's I I feel like we are pretty good. So like I I feel like we sh- definitely gonna want to make playoffs uh, at the very least. And uh, but we haven't you know played Bo fives together or anything like that yet. So I I I don't expect us to just lose in the first round or anything. But I. I'm more like excited to see, you know, how far we can take it uh, when we get to those uh, scenarios. But if I would say about how our play is, I think it's pretty good. I think all my teammates play very well, and I also think we are like, um, I think we play well together too. So I, I think we can, you know, I, I think there is a world in where we can win the split as well. Like, what about Nukeduck for? Like you gave all those mid laners. Is Nukeduck in that mix of mid laners? Uh, I think so. I think I'm definitely on the level of the top uh, mid laner um, of the top teams, uh, I would say. So I don't think they got advantage uh, against us because of mid lane. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. 
how 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 is how long has it taken to kind of adjust Mickey into this roster? Would you say? Do you feel like he's like a hundred percent in yet? Because uh, it was a little shaky, like right when he came on board. But this last week, I think he looked really good. Uh, what what percentage of the way do you think you are to getting like full synergy with the new support in the team? I think we have we have pretty much full synergy. Uh, I think the only uh, dif- the only thing you have to get a bit used to is that we like to sometimes uh, make like a low. Uh, what's what's your, how do you say like fight when we even though we are lower number, uh, okay. we sometimes like to do this and it's like uh, it's not something that you can re- or it's just some our feeling. It's like okay, we can go for this. You know, we can fight like two versus three. Or something like that, and you try mean, to like man out- disadvantage basically when you say low number, yeah. as in you are two, yeah. three, yeah. you are three, yeah, yeah. Four. yeah, it's okay, yes, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And sometimes we try to do this, um, just uh, to you know, if we think that we can outplay or we think we're uh, we are actually sure. really strong, or we can one shot one guy and kite back or something, yes, we, we kind of like to do that sometimes. And uh, I think just uh, that's just what uh, he had to get adjusted to. I think it's especially Mark loved, loves to fight, uh, even if, uh, you know, it, whatever, you know, if he's strong, he thinks he wants to fight regardless of, you know, the, how many enemies are there or something like that. I've always thought that was like a misunderstood concept anyway. Like at the end of the day, they're all different roles. So tell me which three versus three it is. Not just it's a three versus three. Like, because I've even thought that's the area in casting, Monty, that is the wackest in League of Legends. The equivalent in League of Legends to the famous thing I always say sucks dick in StarCraft, where someone with a 200 supply army is marching into my base where I have like nine workers and all my factories are destroyed, right? In that scenario, we know the cast has to lie and gaslight you that there's some sort of epic like fucking Helm's Deep s called gonna happen now the worst one in league is when everyone's died and the guy's about to get the quadra kill no get the fucking penta and it's the support left like yeah no shit i think he's gonna get it i don't know about you guys but i think his teammates might let him get this one and he might get the fucking penta. it's not a real kill is it it's already killed all the real players that's well, just a fucking guy who heals people I, I i think the other the other like fucking weird thing about league right now is that there are there are a lot of champions or items that if you're shorthanded, like what what Nuke Duck is saying, like okay, so Markun loves it. He loves to play some Xin Zhao, man. He plays a lot of Xin Zhao, like loves that, loves that champ. And the thing about Xin Zhao is you can be a player down because Xin Zhao will take no damage. So you can engage, kill someone, and then leave or continue the fight even or stronger, right? So uh, the game is, and Stopwatch will do the same thing a lot of the times. Gwen will do the same thing, right? There are ways to take fights, or as we were talking about earlier, I mean, if Nuke Duck's playing Vagar, you can just zone somebody out of a flight fight completely or stun them and kill them instantly. So there's a lot of factors right now that allow you to take shorthanded fights if you have the right champions and you feel that you can engage, especially if you're playing tons of Xin Zhao, which has very strong engage and a way to r- basically create a front line that removes a lot of the damage from the other team and allows you to focus down somebody really fast. Yep. Now I will say it is a bit easier though to do that against a little bit the weaker teams than the absolute strongest ones. I feel like when you play like weaker weak when you play as like weaker team that it's a bit easier. So but uh, but we try like we, we it's also we don't always play that's exactly the same aggressive on competitive but because we're trying to do it. All right. And that's it, isn't it? I think we covered everything there. <laughs> Do you have any final remarks you need to make? Um, I don't think so. I think I'm good. Just uh, thanks for watching yeah. and all that. Yeah, thanks. Right, what we'll do now, guys, is after this little break, I don't, listen, I'm not the fucking producer, so I don't know what music he plays. Get mad at him, not me. I'm just saying shit. He's not in my ear. If he is, shut the fuck up, I'm talking. Right, so (laughs) he's going to do something. I don't know. He's going to push buttons. Some music or some sort of visual audio display will occur, and Nuke Duck will disappear, and then we, me and Monty will reappear, and we'll start answering questions for people who buy cryptocurrency, because, yeah, it's 2022. Welcome, motherfuckers. (laughs) Right, for this section, the viewer questions part should be self-explanatory. If it isn't, get the fuck out. I don't want you as a viewer. You don't even know what two words mean in English. And even if you go, but I'm not from English. Well, then get a fucking book. There's loads of them out there. So for this section, I'll be passing it off to Monty just because I actually don't ever go in my own Discord <laughs> channel. No, what, like, I just don't go in that specific in the spot. So I don't even know where you get the questions. So Monty can explain all that jazz. How, what's the rot on how they get the coin and what they do with it? Explain that again for the millionth time. So on Rally, there's instructions. We have our Grog coin. 
uh, and you go to the GrogCoin Lounge, there's a pinned post, and it'll tell you how to get GrogCoin. And then once you get it, you'll it'll be into a channel where you can ask questions on SI or the Four Horsemen. And so then we read them. And most of the time they're good because there's actually a barrier to entry, which creates much more interesting conversations, I would say. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, what would it take for the value of an LEC team slot to surpass the value of an LCS team slot? And do you think it would happen? It may already have happened, guys. Uh, who knows, right? Well, I mean, think about it. When was the last L L the last LCS plot? No, LEC, that was LEC. Yeah, right, the right. last LCS team sold must have been like before franchises or something. Like it's so many years ago mm -hmm. that we don't really have like an A-B test on that, do we? Was, you're saying, was, the Schalke one was a lot of money. It was 26.4 million euros or whatever, right? It was Dignitas and Immortals bought slots afterwards. But I think that was a year after the franchising okay. right um because clutch sold uh, yes yep that's true and immortals bought a slot because they weren't in the original franchising but that was actually yes. pretty so also the the lec slots were sold for a couple million per less in the original franchise um so uh but the latest one was like 30 million for the shalka sale and a lot of that is just because frankly lec viewership is significantly higher than lcs viewership right now the league is more competitive um so i don't know i actually think probably lec slots are worth more than L lcs slots right now so i guess i disagree with the premise of the question i also think actually even though this isn't relevant right now because all these teams are involved to me, LCS, how much the slot is worth, to me, would be more contingent also on which other orgs are in the league. Like, if we're talking in five years, Monty, and there's no Cloud9 in team, well, then who gives a fuck about being LCS? But if you can be in a league with TSM, Cloud9, you know, like, that's that has a massive value in itself. You know, yeah, they're I think, already established. But I think, you know, being in a league like LEC with teams like G2 and, and Fnatic is is valuable also. So, I, I mean, just in terms of viewership right now, you'd have to believe that LEC teams are, are worth more. Um, they and they also have a better pipeline to you know getting it's a big talent. League, league, obviously, yeah, yeah. Uh, question for Thorin: How does it make you feel that your boy Flame is now hard stuck in Diamond Three KR one, solo queue one tricking Jana top? That is quite the fall from grace. Yeah, but here's the problem, Monty. <laughs> I started watching him play in 2012. It is 2022. If it took you until 2022 to be able to talk shit, all you need to know is this, and these are facts. Flame's career ended playing for the team, which became the world champion, and he was literally replacing the Gori and winning games against SKT. Suck both our nuts. There you go. I mean, that was just facts. All I did is just give you some facts there, boys. So suck both them nuts. That's how it ended. I actually like this question. So in honor of Peter Dunn's love of all things Mr. Darcy, that Pride and Prejudice was fabulous, by the way. The, I just love everything about him. Oh, metal in is that he didn't say that out loud. That's <laughs> metal in it. Just keep that. That's supposed to be like a secret shame, isn't it? Like your guilty pleasure or some shit. I'm just bragging about it. I think I think it's saying more things about you and how you perceive yourself, Thor. I don't think it's a problem. Anyway, what is your guilty pleasure Gosh. book, show, movie? Ooh, let me think about this. Oh, easy for that. Because here's the thing. Unlike other idiots, I always just say my guilty pleasures because I don't think it's a big deal so for example in music I like fucking because I was from Counter-Strike I like all that dog shit new metal music like Limp Bizkit and that I don't have it's the shit I fucking love that, so that shit from the early 2000s love it if you want to go with TV shows because I grew up and when I here's what people won't understand right is on the one hand I look down on all you Zoomers because all you do is watch all these garbage fucking TV products that are about comics right but they're all just terrible the reason why I could justifiably do that are you ready for the really most ridiculous corp ever is because because in my era, there was none. Like, you would every 10 years get one massive blockbuster movie, and that was about it, right? Aside from that, the idea there would ever be a TV show about a comic book character, no, no way. Or if there was, they'd have skewed it, like, something totally different that wouldn't be anything like the show. So you have to realise, even though, look, it's not a great show, when the show Smallville came out, if you were a comics fan, by the way, that was next-level shit. You were like, holy fuck, there's, like, a real TV show every week, and it's about the premise of, like, Superman as a part. That was a fucking banger concept. So even though, by the way, it ain't a great show, Sure, but it's a guilty pleasure. It's what I enjoyed watching back in the day, you know, add some charm to it, you know. I, I mean, what would yours be, Monty? What's yours? Uh, here? My name is a guilty pleasure. It's not like I think The Count of Monte Cristo is the best book ever written. It's a fucking 19th century soap opera, guys. Like, it was literally, you have to understand that Dumas, uh, Alexander Dumas, who wrote Three Musketeers, Count of Monte Cristo, Man in the Iron Mask, uh, all of these books, right, um, was 
at the time, I, th the way that people consumed media was in serialized content based off of like magazines and newspapers. So all of these all of these books were actually published like chapter by chapter, week by week. And instead of watching TV, people would buy the latest chapter of The Count of Monte Cristo. And it is a fucking soap opera, guys. Like the book is, the plot is convoluted and fucking terrible. But it is, it is a, it is a guilty pleasure of mine that I really enjoy these kind of silly characters that exist in this book, this overly dramatic and complicated plot. But in the same way that you guys are all watching the latest garbage Marvel movie or television show, this was the popular entertainment of the of the day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's it, I would say it's in my name. What other like books or shows or movies? What TV shows do I really enjoy um, that might be considered guilty pleasures? I'm trying to think. Um, well, I mean, here's the problem, right? You're going to get offended, but I don't give a fuck. You should just own this as a guilty pleasure. You love the fucking expanse. I mean, do the love first, the expanse. The first season of that show is appalling. <laughs> it is appalling television, mate. I'll give you that it picks up as the third season, no, but that no, third no. season will turn anyone off that show. I can see yeah. why it never became a massive show, like outside of nerd circles as a result. No, no, the problem no. is you, have, you have to basically tell people what no one wants to hear, which is just watch an entire season, then it gets good. Like, you can't tell people that, mate. So, people won't we'll invest if you do that. Well, for, for the same reason, so I like the expanse season one, uh, but for the same reason that I like dog shit 1940s film noir movies right again it's overly dramatic film noir you just if you like film noir you know you just buy into all of the ridiculousness of it and it is a space film noir so if you don't like film noir you're not going to like the first season of the expanse now it's not really film noir past that point in time also the expanse has other problems such as the main actor being terrible Oh, it's like, bad. The guy it who really plays Holden is yeah. terrible. But it's, it's all the side character actors that make yes. that short. Oh, I mean, but it also yeah. has a bunch of really good actors and really good characters in it. Um, but season two, season three, the, the ending of the expanse just happened. It was really good. I thought the ending was was strong. Um I I like the first season, but I understand why people don't. Like, I'll I'm, tell you who Loki, the real best actor in that show is. I'll have to find what his fucking name is. I'm just looking it up now. It's basically that guy who's that, like, British actor who was in The Crown as, like, King George, and he was in fucking Mad Men as that British character. He's the one who plays the, like, the one with the South African accent in that show. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Help. No, he's great that guy, in that show. That guy's a fucking mega actor. Like, the last 10 yeah. years, he's really come out of his shell and become fucking mega in everything he's in. It's too bad they you know, didn't the guy use him about. more. Yeah, yeah. It's too bad they didn't use him more. Uh, he was the guy who was running series station, the Belter guy. Yeah, he was great. Yes, it's too bad they didn't use him more in the series. But there was a bunch of super all the female characters in that show fucking rule. Uh so I mean, I don't know. I think I think it's a great TV show. Uh, but I understand that. Uh, what about musically? I mean, put it this way, again, without fucking breaking any per private confidences. I've told this story before, Monty, as a joke, so maybe it'll lead into it. You know the story of when we were in Korea and you were like, do you want to come and see Imagine Dragons? We could go backstage. <laughs> I don't and I like, like Imagine Dragons. And I was like, no, and I don't care that we can go backstage. Because that's just who I am as a person. I don't give a fuck, right? Yeah. But I'm not saying you do, but I'm saying, is there anyone in that vein where, you know, to other people that be cheesy? That's why I did the Lip Biscuit one. I, I'm aware people will look down on it. I don't give a fuck. I also like, love, by the way, I late guess... 90s trance music that ever, essentially was only designed to be listened to on drugs. And I'm just like a loser, <laughs> listen to it not on drugs on a PC. Yeah, that's right. How you like that? How you like them I, apples? I, I, you know, I guess... that fucking classic, like, you think you're better off alone. Da, 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 da. I love that shit, man. I'll be playing that all the time when I'm playing League. When I'm Terrorist Pike ruining everyone else's game, all nine people in the server. By the way, spoiler, I joined the game and my joke is the reason why Riot gives you 1 minute 29 before the boss spawns is so that everyone has the chance to click exclamation mark off exclamation mark off exclamation nine times and then you do nine times all the emotes off that's what that first one minute 29 is for so you don't have to ever interact with another human being because it's the only thing that can tilt you in League of Legends is another <laughs> human being attempting to communicate with me that that will not stand I can handle linting bad games so anyway yeah I've been listening to that shit all the time what do you listen to in music then come on there's got to be something you listen to uh, so I, I, I like I have a I have a weakness for 90s pop punk like Green Day and Offspring okay the sort of think, fake pop when it became mega commercialized, basically. Yeah, there you I, mean, go. I like real punk too. Like I'm a big early Bad Religion fan, uh, but I, I do definitely have a, a soft spot for like 
made in late Us. 90s Green Day. <laughs> and spoiler, by the way, if you are actually a pleb who has only heard of the bands he's talking about, like Green Day, Sum 41, spoiler, just go and listen to like the first like four bad al- religion albums. They're just that, but like 10 times better, literally. You're, there's no <laughs> chance you're not going to like it, literally. Like, you're literally going to think these are the best albums you've ever heard because you haven't heard Far Back. I do on. love Bad Religion. I, but before, before Sorrow, like, I mean, they're... The early Bad Religion stuff is fucking... Yeah, yeah. It's mega. Um, it's, it's like the Ramones. If you like one track, you're going to like every single song on the album, basically. Yeah. Or so within or a similar go, sort of wheelhouse, you know. Go, go listen to AFI when they were good before they went like mega commercial and started doing Miss Murder and all that stuff. Like listen to Black Sails in the Sunset or The Art of Drowning or Sing the Sorrow. Like Sing the Sorrow less, but the, the other two, super good. It's um, a perfect segue, Monty. You watch how this is done. And of course, my biggest guilty pleasure has to be this shit game called League of Legends, which is Barbie's <laughs> first MOBA, because I even actually used to fucking play Dota back in the day, and I knew it was a way superior game. I'll even say it right now, and I don't care how many feelings get hurt. Hon was better. Hon actually looked fucking good. They just fucked up the whole model by making you have to pay for it instead of going freemium, so they blew the whole market, basically. But yeah, whatever. There's my guilty pleasure, League of Legends. Because you don't <laughs> even get this, mate. I have Legends. Like, I have like the greatest Counter Strike players ever. Will just message me, Monty, on like Facebook and be like, "Why do you follow fucking League of Legends though?" Because they don't get it. Like they know I'm supposed to be the most hard. I was the guy in Counter Strike who used to go. You know, Counter Strike's actually quick shit compared to Quake. And now the joke, Monty, is everyone tells me like, "Ah, oh, you're from Counter Strike, the greatest game ever in esports." I'm like, "It's all right. It's not even the best Counter Strike, but whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever." We can't have nice things anymore. Though, no, we can't. You just gotta, you gotta just do what you can at this point in time, haven't you? <laughs> I guess we just have to listen to more shitty K-pop songs. But it's weird. Uh, this is maybe a question I'll save for a Four Horsemen episode because it could be a fun sidebar. All I would do is this, right? You're going to think I'm saying this is a joke, but when you realize that this would be a legitimately really interesting segment, you realize how dark esports has become. Here's the question, Monty. Is there an evil regime slash dictator that the esports industry wouldn't interact with for enough money? <laughs> That's actually, it goes from being a joke to being a really interesting sidebar, doesn't it, actually, right now? Because the question is, for how much money? That's what we've now learned. Is like, where's the fuck? What, what is everyone's price? <laughs> it's true. Yep, uh, literally everybody at Riot working for the Chinese government. Everyone, everyone literally yeah. everybody at ESL and Face it working for the Saudi government. Classic, classic. And then all the people in the other games who still haven't figured it out yet. Guess what? They're coming for all of you as well. So if you're like, I'm safe though because I'm in Rainbow Six and the next major is being announced in the United Arab Emirates. It's coming for all of you. You are aware. <laughs> this is like some Thanos shit. It is inevitable. So if you've been out there grandstanding, you're going to have a really bad time the next few years. It's going to be so bad for you. Dude, or you're just going to have to that... eat a player shit, you know. That Rainbow Six major in the UAE is absolutely wild, Hilarious, considering like what Ubisoft says publicly and like the the talent that. Oh, they're they trying have. to be one of the most woke companies as well, of course. Yeah. So that's 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 going to be interesting for sure. Uh, it's time to shatter the meta. Pick one of the following changes to Institute for, for Pro Play. One, mid lane no longer has tier one turrets. Interesting. Two, jungle camps all spawn one minute later. Three, Drake draft. After all picks are completed, blue side bans two Drakes, red side picks the Drake for the game, or other way. Well, that's an interesting one. I I just want Drakes to show spawn order during draft. But Drake draft would actually be fun, I think. But only in pro play. Only in pro play. Like, in casual play, I think it would just add more time that I've people would I've dodge. Got, I've got my own suggestion that I've crafted based on that, Monty. What about this as an option? You can veto one type of Drake. Yeah, it would be good. You know what I mean? Just to, just again to see what your position, how you comp, what the other person does, strategic element. I think that'll be another interesting angle. What what I would do is to do the the Drake vetoes, and then before you do those first, and then you show Drake spawn order for draft for there pick and ban. That would actually be sick. I would love that. Imagine um, how many interesting sort of rabbit holes you could go in with dra- drafting your comp, knowing what's potentially coming up. It could be amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be. I think it would of be the ones really they suggested, good. though, which one would you pick? Probably Drake Draft, but I kind of. An, I don't want jungle camps all spawning one minute no, later because yeah. that, that. I mean, basically, junglers wouldn't have anything to do besides gank lane, so I think it would become super random and predictable. Well, not random. I mean, it would become. It would become predictable because the junglers would immediately be ganking uh, every single time. Basically, yeah. And you have to remember, I come from Warcraft 3 where I like farming in the early game. That's like my jam in terms of strategy, (laughs) just creeping PvE action. So uh, I don't think I'd like that one. But mid lane no longer having tier one turrets might be interesting, but I think it would probably narrow the mid lane 
uh, champion pool quite a bit, and it would make wave manipulation super weird. Um, so I don't know. I don't know about that one. I think Drake Draft is where I would go. Uh, in my opinion, picking up an Eastern coach has this weird variable of taking on a multi-pronged assault. This involves a long-term investment to reverse engineer what may have been good just too late. Now, the problem in particular is if you wanted to take on a multi-pronged assault, it would be done better for probably via scouting. I'm trying to understand what this question is. However, even if a scouted player is good, various factors such as sleeping on cultural whiplash and specializations of players from time to time have continually been glossed over. So my question is, how far is scouting developed in Western leagues in terms of not just players, but coaches? Uh, I mean, coach scouting is very bad in general, I would say. <laughs> I would just say, look, every offseason, right? Every offseason has these moves where it's like, how, how, not only how did this guy get in the league, but then what, like, Jensen isn't in the league. You know what I mean? There's, that happens every bloody year, mate. Like every year, there's these pickups that are like, who's picking these guys up? Like, like I mean, it goes out the same teams like the Australis lineup. It's like, who are, who's signing these players, mate? Like, where's the scouting? Is there any scouting? Does someone just put some names in a hat? It feels like it sometimes. I, I think also that there isn't enough time that coaches are given to adjust to different regions, especially if you were to take an Eastern coach. Like, you really do have to commit for a couple of years in order for them to enact their vision and build the project. Even the, even the cloud nine LS thing, like it, it didn't happen overnight, right? Like LS had Vagar V2 and Max Waldo already for a year yeah, on the so cloud nine co yeah, coaching sure. staff. Like the, you know, the pump was primed before he yes. even got there. Um, so it, it's not even that sudden to have him in there. It's just more aligning their current coaching staff with a head coach who already has deep relationships with some of these people. So I don't know. I think that I think a lot of times coaches aren't given enough time in order to be successful, especially if they're coming from a uh, different region and may not even be fluent in the language when they come on board or come over to the West. I basically think that on the one hand, there are certain coaches, I even referenced them earlier, there's certain people I think are just so tenured, you'd give them a shot if you were like a big Western team. But beyond that, I actually think it's mega overrated to recruit them because the problem I've seen is this. Because again, people are going to forget this. Everyone forgets now. The LCS has had a whole bunch of coaches that were like top Korean fucking figures that should have been game changers, but weren't. And part of the reason why is they themselves walk into a complete culture clash where they're like, it's like they're a fish that's just on land now. They're like, where's all the water? It's like, like essentially the joke is the water in this analogy is like just automatic respect because of Korean culture. Like that ain't going to happen. And or even practicing worse, all the time, you know what I mean? Oh, like, everything like that. Yeah. <laughs> the, difference, the difference is you're never even have going to had a conversation where the player goes, this is too many scrims. Like you're going to have to have that probably in week two when you're in LCS. So yep. yeah, to me, unfortunately, I think the, the, the disadvantages of what the coach himself won't know will be there when he arrives actually sort of like limit whatever strengths he brought. And also let's be real. Like since he's the coach, it's essentially the number one communicator of your team. Why would you want him to not have very good fucking main language? I, you know, man, the number one quality, I'm sorry, this might be a crazy statement, I would want in a Western coach is really good English. That's the fucking language you have to tell me. The only way you can communicate your ideas into my mind is through fucking little mouth noises, like, unless you're some wicked drawer or something. Like, what are you going to do? So I think, I think unfortunately, like, the whole, like, hire the best Korean coaches, essentially, you'd have to do, like, what you did with LS. You'd have to build a whole team around what they want to... And the difference is, like, the LS one, at least he is a native fucking American. Like, there's a... If anything, he's sort of the fucking unicorn. He's the daywalker in here. That's why I actually thought the initial Cloud9 move was a good one. They did everything else you needed to do to give it a chance to work but to me it's like nah I don't think like signing these Asian coaches makes sense unless like I say unless like Cobra's available yeah maybe I'd go for it I'd maybe give it a year you know I mean Reaper's been very successful but Reaper also has a very uh, he was willing to and able to learn English very quickly right and like he already had a foundation in English so I think there are certain circumstances where it can work um is FlyQuest good, or are they a pretender waiting to get exposed? They, they are fraudulent, the fraudulent. You can fraudulent. scroll back on the VOD after this, by the way, and just go to the beginning. We talked about it for like 20 minutes. Yeah, It'll be like uh, a, it'll be like 50 minutes in, I'm guessing, or 40 minutes in or something. Yeah, just wait Just wait until Aframu can't play Melee supports anymore, or like his normal wheelhouse. Also, early year Aframu. Aframu is good at the start of every season, guys. Remember Dignitas last year? Like, he pops off, and then he falls off. Um, 
Is LCS play actually better than LEC right now, counting not just the top teams, but across the whole spectrum? No. Do the low lows of like LCS? It. No. Um, I, I, I think that there was a lot of hype because of the strategy variants uh, in LCS, sure. because people were more willing to play Enchanter Tops. We saw the cool drafts from LS. We saw the more standard play um, kind of from Team Liquid. Uh, EG was obviously doing well during lock-in. I still think that EG is going to get their shit together. Like, I think they're probably underperforming a bit right now, but I, I don't think that they're better than LEC teams. No, not, not really. Maybe team liquid is like, you could, you could make a compelling argument that team liquid will be the best Western team, but I don't think yeah, they're the on main, average. Basically the main problem and why I think people aren't that hype on the LEC split right now is just that the only team that was a dominant team was Rogue, who no one believes in. And all the other teams just kept having weeks. Like, like every single one of them has done it. Fanatic G2, Mad, like they're all having weeks where they just shut the bed completely for no reason. So it just makes it feel like this top of the league isn't as strong. But the problem is this, if you go into LEC, any playoff team would be dangerous in LCS would have like interest in play. LCS is like, there's a couple of teams. Like I said, it's really like two teams. It's just Team Liquid at Cloud9, let's be real. And who knows about Cloud9 now? Beyond that, like, those are just okay teams. Like, that, like there's definitely more talent than the last few years in LCS, but I don't think LCS compares to LEC at the moment. It's just you don't have those dominant LEC teams right now. So I'd say wait till the summer, and then you'll see LEC will take off and teams will all be cemented, etc. Maybe do one more question or something. Uh, we've got a couple more. If you could do a modern league champ item, et cetera, back in time, so a modern item, and give it to any player or team to see what they could do with it, which thing would you choose? Oh, come on. Oh, wait a second. So it has to be a real thing that exists yeah. now we're going back Dude, in time with. Give me Holebreaker and give it to Flame. Let's go. <laughs> oh, anything like that would be amazing. Any split push shit, right? <laughs> Holebreaker, taking Holebreaker back to to 2014 or 2013 would be insane. That oh, would be, be some amazing. Also, I think there's some I, of the amazing solo laners who could use that shit. I, I will even, I will, I will also uh, do, let's see, we could do the reverse. I would bring Deathfire Grasp into the modern game. <laughs> that, would <be> the <laughs> that would be fucking hilarious for assassin players right now. Uh, <laughs> what color are your socks? My socks are gray and red. There you go. You look at my feet. Uh, can Rookie and Carsa make a playoff run against the gamut of LPL super teams? I, I actually haven't watched a lot of LPL this split, so I feel like I'm not really qualified to to say that. But it seems like Rookie's been doing pretty well overall. Uh, the the problem the at team. the moment in the LPL is they had an enormous offseason where they had all sorts of like crazy roster moves back and forwards and teams. Cheer. And basically, because of how much money there is in the LPL, you got teams that were some of the worst orgs now actually have some of the better players even. So it's all over the place right now. Like I've watched some of the big games, but even then, like there aren't the same established teams that there were before. Like basically almost everyone except the EDG just changed the fuck out of their rosters if people didn't see. Like even like for example, uh, Xiao who plays mid lane again now in RNG. Like the, everything's up and down, it's all over the yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> Even the shy is actually good now. Stopped him in for like two weeks or something. So I, I don't know about that. Maybe maybe the problem was that he and Rookie were like int addicts together, and so yeah, they were just enabling each other's inting. And so now that they've split up, you know. I mean, low key they were because here's the fucked up thing. I know everyone thinks from interviews like that the rookie must have been here in the shy, right? Dude, if you read the interviews with those two guys, I think they both love each other. I think they both think that they're like they have that shit where it's like they're just locked in the fucking codependency and they think that, that like always had to be like that. So whatever, it's a whatever in it. By the way, as an aside, did you see that post? I don't know if you saw this on Reddit where someone translated where Apto basically thinks that IG in season eight ruined League of Legends because his premise goes that like since the solo liners in that team basically he had like a whole analogy a bit like the herbivore carnivore thing where he describes it's like the difference between being a tiger as a laner and being a cat yeah, I saw that. and you know the idea is a tiger is like the savage little tail part every chance they get his base basically his premise goes it's quite an interesting premise actually is that cause rookie in the shy could just do that all the time and basically just like just basically bully the other team every other team he thinks in the world because they won worlds just tried to do that even when they didn't have the players to do it I th here's the thing even though obviously it's like a very bold statement i can see the seeds of what he's talking about like, i think there's a logic to it because it did ruin macro i think for like a couple of years after that <laughs> yeah i i it also i think there there's a truth to it but also like laning became more important over time right so there's also there's also a factor to it where that style of play began to be 
be more rewarded in its own way. But then also you saw players like Doanby that were kind of the opposite of that when they when they won the world championship. So I think probably the mentality though did become too much to be lane dominated, not thinking about the overall macro of the game. But Riot has been slowly over time sliding the weight of micro towards micro and away from macro that's been the way they've been balancing the game and creating the runes and creating the items and everything like that so even this teleport rewarding. change implies it right like they've made yep. the get they made the whole macro of the game like my joke and this is what i think sucks about league of legends is league of legends before was like an open-ended game world where you could choose at any point in the game depending on what your champions were as was like your tools in the game state you could choose all sorts of different things you could do now the game feels like fucking time crisis it's like i'm on these rails where i'm heading towards certain things and i could just do things along the way it's like i have no choice i have to end up with this dragon fight i, I yep. have to end up with this herald fight like i don't have any choice in the matter like or i can just lose the game i guess like what the fuck? that's why half the team half the team fights i think suck in the modern day are the ones where the team that can't position at all for the dragon fight just turn up to it watch the other team take it and then slowly back off while losing one or two players i watch those and i'm like what how can this be season fucking 12 or whatever like oh. this is garbo this it's looks so bad guys <laughs> it's less bad than it was early last year i would say True. because because at least they increased like tier two side like top and bot turret gold so that you can play more of a split push style and now everybody's building hullbreaker first right so there is it is more viable than it has been to play early herald hullbreaker split pushing but it's still kind of that way yeah, it's still too much that way, but it is better than it used to be. But bring right, it back to the question. We will do an LPL episode in the future. Don't worry. We'll get like another expert on it. We'll, we'll get into that shit. Yeah. Uh, what is your preferred page holding method between sessions while reading a book? Bookmark, folded page. Uh, I, I'll just leave it open and face down on that page or I'll remember the page or I will fold the corner of the page. Those are typically the ways I do it. Or I read on my Kindle so I don't have to do any of that. Problem is, even though I will say I'm not someone who takes like super good care of everything and keeps it all perfect. Like I don't care, for example, if like this, if the corners of a book get all like tattered, I don't care. I just read it for the sake of reading it. But I will say I actually just on like some OCD level, I can't handle it when people actually fold that page in and he's got like a hundred of them in a row. It just <laughs> everything about it's fucked. I hate it. So so I never do that. I, I just either A use an old school bookmark or B, and this is when I this is where I should just just it's like a guilty pleasure. I should just admit it and use a bookmark every time. Sometimes, Monty, I try to tell myself in my mind, well, if I if I read it often enough, then I don't, don't need the bookmark. I should know where I am, which just leads to really frustrating things where you keep reading the same five pages over and like, fuck, I should have <laughs> fucking put a bookmark in. Just I couldn't remember this one sentence. I've gone back and reread some I definitely read before. So bookmark probably the best approach, let's be real. Yeah, so I just abuse my books by destroying the bindings, by just storing them flat <laughs> face down, or by folding the pages. Also, what is also great about Kindle as well, etc., by the way, obviously you just got your place saved, don't you? You're always in the exact spot you were fucking on. I love that feature. Yeah, the other problem is I read like three books at the same time, so I often have like a pile of books that are all just open on top of each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. I don't advise my way of doing it. I don't advise my way of doing it. <laughs> All right. That's the last question. 